Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Madam Clerk, I don't, I don't think we have any regrets for tonight. And um, Council, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Councillor Adams. I'd like to declare an interest in item C1 as it relates in part to uh, my wife's employer, TDL Group. Okay. Um, Council, we need a mover and seconder to resolve on the Committee of the Hall. Councillor Duddick and uh, Councillor Lapworth, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. <coughs> Council is now resolved into Committee of the Hall, which is a, a, a rules relaxed session of Council that allows us to uh, hear more uh, in more detail for, and at greater length from the public on planning matters. And Council, the first, uh, uh, can, you've got four consent items in front of you, two public and two confidential. How do you wish, Councillor Duddick is moving all four um, consent items, the two public and the two confidential. And we're going to separate the vote uh, so that C1 is voted separately so that Councillor Adams can push back from the table and not be involved in that because of his declared conflict. All right, so I'll first call the vote on uh, the three. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and they are carried. Now, Councillor Adams, you want to push back? I'll call the vote on C1. All those in favor? Those opposed? And we'll minute that Councillor Adams did not participate. And that brings us to our public hearing item, the public meeting report, the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments for um, 231, 237 Rebecca Street. And I, I'm going to just bet that most of the public interest here tonight is in this item. And I see some faces who I haven't seen before, so you may not be familiar. If you are familiar, forgive me for telling you all what you already know, but this is not a uh, decision night. This is a, a public hearing input night, and after council has heard from the public on this application, staff will take away what they, the information that they received tonight, and at a later date, council uh, will consider a recommendation report. And everyone who's participated uh, will be able to have notice of the return of the item. So we'll see you again then, no doubt. And with that, if we give our attention to Lee Musson, she will summarize for the public the report that council has already digested, although I suspect most of you have too. Lee? Good evening, Mayor Burton, members of council. This evening you'll find my staff report on page three of your agenda. This is a statutory public meeting for an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by 2378224 Ontario Inc. I refer to them as the Rebecca Street applications. The applications were received on September 4th of last year. They were deemed complete on September 25th and the public information meeting was held on November 25th last year as well. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to obtain any further public input related to these applications. Planning staff are not making a recommendation at this time and the report is to be received by council. The applications have been submitted to allow the site outlined in red on your screen to be developed for six townhouse units. The site is generally located east of Dorval Road on the north side of Rebecca Street and is municipally known as 231 and 237 Rebecca Street. The property is approximately 0 0.13 hectares in size with 33 meters of frontage on Margaret Drive and approximately 38 meters of frontage on Rebecca Street. Each property con currently contains a single detached dwelling. In terms of surrounding land uses, to the south, although it's not uh, shown on this plan, is a four-story residential building known as the Van Dyke uh, Wyndham Place development, which was recently constructed. It was four stories with approximately 100 uh, units in it. On the southeast corner of Garden Drive and Rebecca Street is three-story, six-townhouse development, which was constructed in around 2010. Further down on Garden Drive uh, is a development uh, that Council recently approved a rezoning for 18 three-story townhouses. To the west of the subject site 
Uh, west of Dorval Drive are the D&D lands, or the former D&D lands, which there are currently three-story townhouses currently under construction. To the east of the subject site is a private stormwater management pond and some two-story townhouse units, part of the Barclays Square condominium. Further east are single detached dwellings. To the north of the subject site, you'll find more two-story townhouses forming, again, part of the Barclays Square condominium. The majority of the, the units within this uh, development have frontage on a private condominium roadway, with some units having frontage on Margaret Drive, a public street. And I believe this development was constructed in around 1998. This is a, an illustration of the concept that's before you this evening. It illustrates six townhouse units oriented towards Rebecca Street. The applicant is proposing access from Margaret Drive by way of a six meter wide laneway, which will eventually become a, con a, a common elements condominium. Each unit, uh, the applicant is proposing two parking spaces for each unit. And the next series of slides actually are the elevations as proposed by the developer. This is the Rebecca Street frontage. This is the rear of the, uh, the townhouse development, which would face the Barclays Square residence. And this is the east and south elevations as well. In terms of the livable Oakville plan, the site is designated as low density residen residential, as identified on Schedule G, the southeast land use. Directly north, you'll notice the lands are designated as medium density residential, and also to the east. On the south of the subject site, the lands are designated high density residential. On the west side of Dorval, the former D&D lands, the in effect designation is low density uh, special policy. However, he recalled there was a special policy that was adopted by council last year, and OPA 4 uh, it proposes that the Dorval frontage be redesignated to residential medium density, which will implement the study. The official plan designation for the current land uh, would allow de detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, and duplexes. The applicant has submitted an application to amend the official plan to redesignate the lands to residential medium density. If approved, the medium density designation would allow uh, townhouse developments to be constructed on the site up to a density between 30 and 50 units per site hectare. The six townhouses on this site are coming in at approximately 49 units per site hectare. This application will be reviewed and evaluated against the Livable Oakville Plan, specifically with respect to policies 11.1.8, 11.1.9, which speak to intensification within a stable residential neighborhood. And that will form part of the, the analysis will form part of a future recommendation report. I'll also draw your attention that the applicant's official plan amendment is attached to the staff report within Appendix A. In terms of the zoning, the site is zoned R03 under 1984-63 bylaw, and under the 2014-014 bylaw, the lands are zoned RL30. Both zones permit detached dwellings. The applicant has submitted an application to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone the, la the lands to a site-specific RM1 zone. A copy of the applicant's draft zoning bylaw is attached within the staff report as Appendix B. A public information meeting was held on November 25, 2014, last year, and approximately 30 members of the public attended, as did the two ward councillors. Planning staff have received a number of letters of objection, which are attached with an Appendix C, and I understand there's been some additional uh, correspondence that's come in the last couple of days, which I believe have been circulated to you. Issues identified to date relate to conformity with the Livable Oakville Plan, density, intensification, compatibility and height, traffic, cut through traffic and lack of overflow parking, tree retention on the site, privacy and overlook issues, sun and shadow issues, drainage, servicing, garbage and snow removal. In terms of next steps, planning staff will continue to review and anal analyze the merits of the application and all the technical matters around the application and we will evaluate the application again against the official plan. Staff will also review the comments submitted to date from the public and any other issues that are identified this evening. We will be bringing forward a recommendation to Council, however a date has yet to be set for that. In conclusion, staff are putting forward this following recommendation for your consideration and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Council, you have questions? Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Lee. Um, just out of interest, um, and I 
appreciate you indicating uh, the concerns that have been raised thus far, and I dare say um, it'll be beneficial for other members of council to hear, uh, similar to Councillor DeMoff and myself, from the residents most immediately impacted by this development. Out of interest, has the applicant uh, been in contact with staff after that first public information meeting we had where they were able to hear firsthand from residents and the public regarding their concerns? Has there been any indication in terms of any revisions or tweaking to it to address those concerns? Through your worship to the councillor, um, no, we haven't, uh, the applicant hasn't revised their application. What's before you this evening is what was presented at the public information meeting. The applicant is in the audience, so he can speak to maybe he wishes to hear the result of tonight's. Um, I would direct it to his. Any others? All right, then, Madam Clerk, would you call the listed delegations? And when we've gone through that list, I'll poll the audience to see if anyone has thought of anything to say in the meantime. Our first uh, listed delegation is Bob Edwards, who is president of the Halton Condominium Corporation 336. Mr. Edwards, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. And if you, let's see, we'll get the clerk to assist you or someone, but we need the microphone to be pointed at your mouth. That would help. Yep. And uh, <laughs> let's hope all the technology will work for us. And, all right. And away you go. How do I get the slides to operate? I'll help you with that. Oh, you? that help has just arrived at your okay. side. Thank you very Sorry, much. is it, is it uh, Burns? I, I didn't catch the name. I was the no, moment. Edwards. Edwards. That's me, I think, oh. now. All right. How do I get it to move forward? I would use this uh, arrow. Okay. Thank you very much. So if you step over towards the mic. Okay. But you only have to give it this far. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm not used to this. Um, my name is Bob Edwards. I'm president of the Condominium Corporation, and better known as Barclays Square for my sins. I've been a resident of Barclays Square for over 12 years and a member of the board for nine years. Uh, the properties which are the subject of this application are immediately adjacent and overlook both Barclays Square and the townhomes on Margaret Drive. Some of this stuff is a little repetitive because I didn't realize that Lee was going to give us as much detail as she did, so my apologies. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is to voice the community's concerns and opposition to the application filed to rezone the subject properties. Um, I'm going to bring up the livable Oakville, which I've taken the pleasure of reading, 212 pages. Um, this is a plan that was approved by council in, uh, I think it was 2009, and it was updated as late as um, December of last year. Um, this this um, little uh, Oakville plan was the, is the town's official plan, that's my understanding, and the same plan was approved by the region of Holton. This plan has been revised over the years with the latest amendment in December of this year. Um, in that plan, they have a mission statement. It says, um, town's mission as to enhance the town's natural, cultural, social, and economic environments. To ensure that environmental sustainability, cultural vibrancy, economic prosperity, and social well-being. Uh, I've gone too far there are incorporated into growth and development decisions. In addition to that, there is guiding principles included in the, in the town as well, to preserve and create a livable community in order to preserve, enhance, and protect the distinct character, cultural heritage, living environment, and sense of community of neighborhoods. Barclay Square, uh, which is shown above there, it's comprised of 48 townhomes, and our more Margaret Street neighbors are further 17 townhomes. Barclay Square represents 48 townhomes and over 100 residents. Primarily retired professional business people, most have lived in Oakville for the majority of their lives. We as a community have worked hard to support and promote the spirit of livable Oakville's guiding principles. This is clearly evident from the owner's pride in maintaining the properties and investing in the landscaping, etc. Now, Lee's already pointed out exactly where the properties are, so I don't spend, intend to spend any time on that. Um, <clears throat> when we got the notice of application rezoning, it came as a shock to the owners. There were immediate calls for action, and members of the community initiated 
community meetings within ourselves. We provided the petition to the town and a written presentation to the town. Those should be all part of your packages, I believe. Also, uh, there are a fair number of letters which have been sent in expressing the concerns of individuals of the community. Without exception, all owners are strongly opposed to this rezoning application. Now, the objections which we've listed, which are probably a few more than uh, the ones which um, the Council has, uh, and they're going to be, they're going to be addressed um, by other speakers tonight. Um, I'm just going to deal with two of these items. Uh, that's changes zoning, intensification, height of proposed construction, privacy issues, shading concerns, maintaining the character of the neighborhood, traffic and related issues, destruction of trees, and stormwater disposal. All these items were raised by, at various meetings we've had within the community, and they're all part of that presentation, the written presentation that was made by the, communi uh, by the community to the, the, the town. Now, the items that I'm going to deal with are the height of the proposed construction, um, the proposed development is four storeys versus the two storeys of the existing townhomes in Barclays Square and Margaret Square. And that gives you an example of what that looks like side by side. The other objection I want to deal with is maintaining the character of the neighbourhood. The pro proposed new development makes no contribution to the community and is in fact detrimental. This is what we see it as being, and that's actually very much very similar to the one that Lee had on the screen. Um, we note that it eliminates the green space. In fact, this is all part of the uh, Arvis report, which shows that there are currently, right now, there are 13 trees on the site, and based upon the construction impacts, there will be zero. So this site will have no trees on it at all at the end of the day. The architecture is not in harmony with the existing homes. That is the, the slide which I showed a little earlier on, showing the two. On the left-hand side is Barclays Square, on the right-hand side is the proposed development. Um, we also see the other issue we see here also is the fact that this creates a precedent in the neighborhood as well. If you do, do this development here, I think it opens the door to other development, and we are aware of um, um, developers who are in the area actually talking to the people both on um, Maurice and Dean. Um, in fact, I believe one property has already been sold. So our concern is that we end up with a pocket of uh, townhomes, two-storey, in the middle of the development all the way around us with, say, four-storey other townhomes. Community strongly opposes the rezoning and requests council to decline the application. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your information. Yes, Councilor Council. Duddock. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for okay. uh, presenting and articulating it so well. I'm so glad that you uh, raised 2.2.1 regarding the preservation of the existing stable residential neighborhood. Yeah. And although you provided a picture of the entrance going woo into <laughs> the, um, the complex, Perhaps you can give um, some insight for some of the other members of council who may not be so familiar with, I mean, they saw a bit of the built form, yeah. but what makes Barclay Square work so well and why has it become such um, an attraction for people that I understand there's even a waiting list trying yeah. to get in there? What is it that uh, the attributes of it that make it work so well? Well, I think the main thing is it is a community. Uh, we built a community. We've gone, we made the effort to do that. We do barbecues every year for everybody so that people feel part of it. Um, we have a, a Christmas party every year as well. This is all part of the community activities. Um, we help each other a lot. And if there's things that need to be done in the complex, then you can find volunteers without any, without any problems at all. We have our own newsletter. Um, but it's more a question of... Um, uh, People talk to each other outside, the, outside of the townhomes, uh, dur particularly during the summer. It's not so much during the winter, but even, even in the winter as well we get that, where there's a lot of in interchange between people. The word gets around, and um, most of the homes we have in there are actually being sold by referral from people who actually live there. Uh, we have a waiting list, I think, now right now, seven people who are waiting for units to, to buy in there. Most of the properties are sold privately. Um, they don't even go through real estate. Um, it's got a reputation. Uh, the website's part of this. Uh, we put one up, I think it's two years ago now, and we, we get a lot of hits. Um, people really like it. And people are comfortable there, and the word gets around that uh, it's a nice place to live. 
Do you find also the fact that it's, given that it's even so close to a very busy thoroughfare being Rebecca Norvell, it's still relatively quiet. Yeah. I know for having visited some people in the uh, the units there, it's, it's mind-boggling how quiet it is. It's almost like it's, it's off in a very quiet residential neighborhood, which of course it is. Yeah. Um, and the trees, um, I noticed there's quite a lot of well-established um, trees, and it's a very green complex, yeah. and you take quite uh, considerable pride, I assume, in having your trees and maintaining, maintaining it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we spend a fair bit of money on tree maintenance all the time. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demoff. Thank you for coming out tonight and for your presentation. Um, I don't know if you can go backwards, but I, 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 I <laughs> don't worry about it because the, How far it, do well, you want oh, to go? That, not that far. The one where you had your townhouses beside the new one, because mm -hmm. I think um, you know it's it's important to note when you're talking about stories. Um, stories today are built much. Each floor is much higher than your your homes were yep. um, but that development if I'm not mistaken is close to 15 meters tall is, is it not I can't give you the dimensions there um, I th I'm, I'm pretty sure that was yeah. I think it was 14.8 but it's yeah. close to 15 meters which is dwarfs what is um, beside it in, yeah. in yours and if I'm not mistaken it was also taller than the DND lands townhouses across the street yes. yeah. so just in terms to give the other members of council a tr an idea of, of just the magnitude of, of you know the size of these um, they're they're massive in height yeah, compared to what's around there and one of the concerns that will come up a little later on is that um, there are 11 units who, who back directly on to this development uh, which means that they'll be sitting on their patio and the, the um, patios for these units will be on, on top of the garages there, I believe, which means that they will be looking down onto the patios for the people that uh, mm -hmm. um, are in the existing units. And that is a concern. The privacy concern is a, is a major concern. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards, for your information. Can I go? Madam Clerk, uh, <laughs> the, the next delegation. Okay. Next delegation is Fernando Mores. Mr. Moray, welcome. Thank Council you. looks forward to your information. I'm left-handed, so bear with me for a sec. Let's see if I can get this working. Which, which I am you? I'm Fernando. Okay. I am not left-handed, so I'm, I can't do this. <laughs> do, you, do you want to launch it? I can't. You know what? It's okay because I can use this. Go ahead. Just change the position. Sorry. I'm hopeless with my left hand. Good evening, uh, Mr. Burton, councillors, staff. My name is Fernando and I'm a resident of Barclay Square. And I'm here tonight to join my fellow neighbors uh, against this uh, approval of this development. And I basically will provide you three reasons why. First one is this development does not comply with the current town zoning bylaw. The second is detrimental to our established neighborhood. And third one, it's detrimental to the town. It opens a huge precedent to future developments. So, but let's go to this presentation and I, I hope it can give you a clear idea what this development is about. So the application is there. It's a notice to, to basically to go from uh, residential low um, residential low density to residential medium density. So what does that mean is when you go to the zoning bylaw, you see there RL3 has a series of setbacks requirements and rare, uh, minimum rare yard, minimum interior side yard, and so on, so on, so on. So this is what our neighborhood is comprised of today. When you go to the regulations for a medium density, and you go to RM1 column, you see all the numbers there. Don't focus on the number yet because that's the comparison chart. 
And I'd ask you to focus on these numbers. So what the developer is actually asking is that minimum front yards to be taken from the current 7.5 meters to the 4.5 meters, flankage yards to be taken from 3.5 to 3, the minimum rear yard from 7.5 to 6, maximum number of stories 3, and maximum height is 12. So let's take a look at what um, it's being proposed. Well, actually what's being proposed is, and this is part of the application, is actually a further exemption to the bylaw. And I'll just pinpoint these three items. It's actually asking for the minimum frontage to be five meters, the minimum flank flankage yards to be 1.5, and the minimum front yards to be three meters. So when you go back to that chart, actually these numbers are not correct what the developer actually wants are these numbers. So you're taking this property uh, to a minimum front yard from 7.5 to 3 from a minimum flankage anyway. These are the numbers. The number of storage is 4 and I'll explain why it is 4. And the minimum height is 14 plus as already mentioned. So uh, this is the true picture of this development in my case. I'd ask Mr. Mayor and councillors to do what I've done on the PowerPoint presentation. Please do not approve this application. Let's go to the site. Let's take a look what happens there. This is the existing site. It's two sites, two, two, two homes in each, um, probably combining to one. Today what you have is two dwelling units and th 13 um, mature trees on the site. Lots of green space. What the development wants, developer wants, is same site, six townhouses. All combined, you can see there's not much left of a green space there. And then, guess what? A common uh, connect, uh, laneway uh, leading to all the townhouses plus the front um, access uh, aisles. Um, so, as you can see, there's not much left in green in this area. There's not even space to, to, to plant a tree. Did I forget to say that this road has an easement of three meters? So, in the future, three meters of this property will be taken out for a possible widening of Rebecca Street. So, that's left with a very, very little space on this, built on this site. Did I say there's a sidewalk in the back to connect from the garages to the lane? To the, to the laneway. So as you can see how much has been used of the site, this development is incompatible to the site that's being proposed to, to be built on. Um, on top of this, um, when you go to a more technical um, stormwater management report, what it is, is as you can, as you could appreciate, with this amount of building being built on site, therefore not having um, any surface for rainwater to be drained, the stormwater management report calls for a 20.2 cubic meter of water stormwater storage in the site. You know what that means? That means the size of a pickup truck being buried under in a park in the in the in the, in the laneway, underneath that to hold uh, stormwater. That's very detrimental. We can talk about this. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to, but it's a very detrimental um, uh, proposal to go that way. I guess the question is, what's happening to the approved uh, zoning bylaw and livable Oakville standards that we have? Um, furthermore, let's go into these two uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory um, documents and let's see the rules for intensification. Um, just to shorten the presentation, um, clause, uh, paragraph B, within the stable um, residential communities on lands designated low density, intensification of these sites may only may occur with low density. So it's low density against low density. So as this would not be case enough to stop the presentation right here, because we were breaking the rules, we let's go on and let's uh, look into more what the regulations calls for. Again, I'm going to spare some time here. Um, the the uh, 
Furthermore, in the document, we're talking about neighborhood being compatible in character, massing, scale, and height. We're talking about uh, surrounding neighborhood being compatible. We're talking about gradation and height transitions between units and new developments. We are talking about minimizing impacts on drainage, privacy, and microclimate and shadowing. So all these issues have been, have been raised uh, already. So let's take a look at the rare elevation of this, this development. To me, this is a four-story high building. Let's count. Garage entrance, living room, bedroom windows, and master bedroom washroom with double doors access to a balcony. All this is facing Margaret Drive and, Rebecca, and Barclay Square um, condominiums. So wouldn't that be so detrimental if you have this kind of building um, overlooking your place? This is an aerial view. All these units are being affected by this development. This is what we have. Six balconies on the second floor overlook, overlooking our backyards. We have six balconies, washroom, double door balconies from the fourth floor facing our backyard. This is a quick video just to show you what a person sitting on the very first balcony of this development would see in their backyard. This is our backyard. By the way, the trees will not be there if this development goes ahead. There you go, that's Barclay and that's Margaret at the back. This is the same height, approximately the same height at the property line um, of a person sitting on this uh, second story balcony. This is what it's being proposed and that's what it looks like, you've seen this. This is what our community looks like. Well-groomed, landscaped, houses in a very nice, quiet standard, very well color, tone colors, very nicely uh, uh, done, um, places for trees to grow, clean, lots of green, places where a family can walk peacefully across, I'll give you a minute. Compare the existing community to the proposed. You've seen this slide before. I have five questions for you. Are these two buildings comparable in scale, height, or massing? Are, are they complementing each other? Does the proposed development look compatible with existing surrounding neighborhood? Do you see any building gradation in height transition between these two? Does it minimize impacts on drainage, privacy, or microclimate, or shadowing? Your answer was no to all these. So join us, and please do not approve this development. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was certainly exquisitely timed. So, and I, I guess you were editing on the fly. Uh, Councillor, are there questions for Fernando? <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. Madam Clerk. Uh, the next delegation is David Harris, also from the Barclay Square residence. Welcome, Mr. Harris. Uh, you're going to be the uh, perhaps unwitting demonstrator of civics for the visiting Boy Scouts tonight. Good evening, Mayor Burton, councillors, members of the public. Good to see the uh, community support that we have for these issues tonight. Like the previous presenters, I'm representing both the Barclay Square and the lower end of uh, Margaret Drive communities. My name is David Harris, and my wife and I own a unit at Barclay Square that is immediately to the north of the proposed development and only 40 yards away. The living room and master bedroom of our unit and those of our neighbors currently look out onto mature trees which are almost totally which almost totally obscure the bungalows currently on the site. These trees are home to a variety of birds including cardinals not to mention the local squirrel population. If this development proceeds per the zoning application every tree on the site will be removed and we will be looking at a 48 and a half foot high wall, 115 feet long, right in front of us, 
with a significant shadow from this building for the better part of the day. The trees cannot be replaced due to the density of the planned build on the site. Furthermore, given that our units are only two stories in height, with the basements below grade level, and the proposed development is actually four stories in height, since the garages and entrance laneway at the rear are at grade level, even our upstairs bedrooms will be looked down upon by the top two levels of this development, let alone our living rooms and patios. This is a serious invasion of our privacy. Imagine, if you will, someone building a 48-foot high wall in front of your living room, stretching 115 feet in length, with the residents looking down into your house from only 40 yards away. The concerns over shading do not just apply to the Barclay Square units and patios, but to the landscape stormwater collection area immediately outside of the rear fence of the site to be developed. What will be the effect on this vegetation, which is maintained as part of the Barclay Square common areas? Our neighbours at the south end of Margaret Drive have similar issues regarding this development and have asked me to specifically mention their concerns related to the increased traffic past their houses, the feasibility of snow removal from the access laneway of the development, and the fact that garbage pickup may end up being at the rear of the development adjacent to the Margaret Drive units if the development's residents rebel at the idea of having to cart their garbage through their units in order to place it on the sidewalk on Rebecca. In addition, there is the possibility that visitors parking at the development may well park on Margaret Drive, which is a no parking zone. Mayor Burton, councillors, we have a close-knit community of 48 units at Barclay Square and 17 freehold units at the south end of Margaret Drive. And as you have heard, we've received over 80 signatures opposing this development application, as can be seen attached to the planning report prepared for this meeting. That is how strongly the community feels about this application. We have no objection to the development of the site as a low density residential zone, as clearly defined in the official plan and zoning bylaw recently approved by council. And we would welcome two single family dwellings on the site. However, cramming six monster four story townhouses onto this site makes no sense at all and certainly does not comply with our concept of a livable Oakville. I ask on behalf of our neighborhood that you deny this development application. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, David, for coming out tonight and uh, for your presentation. One thing I wondered if you could elaborate on a little bit, because I know it was, it was discussed in the meeting, was the garbage. Um, and the garbage collection plan is for the residents to take it out to Rebecca Street. Um, if the other councillors will recall in the, the picture before, where the garages are at the, at the rear. So do you mind relating to the councillors what, what was said at the meeting in terms of, of how that would be dealt with by the, the proponent? Uh, through you, Mayor Burden. The garages, as you say, are at the rear of the unit, and the presumption is that the residents would have their garbage in their garages throughout the week. However, with pickup on the street side at Rebecca, and because there is no room to walk around those units, it means that the garbage will have to be carted from the garage at the rear, right through the house, out through the front door, to be placed on the sidewalk on Rebecca. And uh, if I was a resident there, I don't think I would be very happy with that arrangement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris, for your Thank information. You. Madam Clerk. The next delegation is Bill Burns. Mr. Byrne. Welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you. <coughs> just going to put up one of the, uh, the site plans. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want if you want to speak to it um, just pop it up just put it up there now yeah it's there great now if you want to okay. point to anything use the mouse to point yep. to it and then the council can see it on the screen okay uh, 
Mr. Mayor and councillors and staff, I um, appreciate being able to speak for a few minutes tonight. My name is Bill Burns. My wife, Maureen Donaher, and I live at Unit 21 on Barclay Square. I'd like to express our concerns about the uh, proposed rezoning and development of the properties at uh, 231 and 237 Rebecca Street. First of all, Maureen and I agree with all of the points of view that have been expressed by the other, other presenters uh, this evening. Barclay Square, as you've seen, is a unique residential development which comfortably fits into the surrounding area of low-density residential homes. Barclay Square is reasonably separated by major streets and low-density homes from the nearby imposing blocks of medium and high-density residential development which have been permitted in a logical fashion under the current Oakville official plan. And I'll just review these for you again. First of all, you have the, uh, the condominiums on the west side of Dorval Drive on the DND property. You have the four-story apartment condominium complex at the corner of uh, Garden and Rebecca. And you have the six units on the uh, southeast corner of that street. And as we've said, this is, this is our complex here. Our specific concern has been mentioned before, is should Council approve the requested change in the zoning from low density residential to medium density residential and allow the property under review to be built to a form similar to the two townhouse complexes that I've mentioned, the one on the, on the uh, southeast corner here and the one on the west corner, um, then that will permit, uh, allow, uh, um, It'll allow the, the council to uh, be open to similar requests to rezone small blocks of the low density residential areas surrounding uh, Barclay Square. One specific example could be the block of properties at 205 and 215 Rebecca Street combined with the property at 156 Maurice Drive. There could be other properties elsewhere on Maurice Drive and Dean Avenue. This, whoops. This, this uh, line up here on Maurice and across on Dean. If any of these properties were to be developed in a similar maximum zoning uh, standard as the other nearby developments, there could be 12 meter high walls of condominiums immediately adjacent to the residences of Barclay Square. And this would basically surround us. I've lost my, my pointer. But that would totally surround us, the possibility. Should this occur, that's okay. Should this occur, the result would be an erosion of our privacy, a decrease in the visual appeal of our homes, and a resulting decline in home value. So I trust that the council will vote against this change in zoning. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your information. Uh, Madam Clerk. The next delegation is Claudio Bruto from Bruto Consulting representing the applicant. Mr. Bruto? Mr. Mayor, members Welcome, of Mr. Kudo, uh, Council looks forward to your information, and we'd uh, we'd be interested to know your relationship to the project. Uh, I'm sure you were going to tell us anyway, but Absolutely. Your, your role. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, my name is Claudio Bruto from Bruto uh, Consulting. I'm here on behalf of the uh, landowners. We are planning consultants and uh, strategic advisory uh, consultants in relation to this particular project. I uh, want to thank members of council and staff and members of the public, particularly the community that has uh, come out uh, 
in substantive numbers uh, both this evening and during the public information se uh, session that was uh, organized uh, late last year. It's always useful to, to get direct feedback from the community. I just commend them on their organization and uh, direct uh, comments to, to the proposal, which we hope to address uh, in part tonight, but that's not my purpose this evening is to sort of give you an introduction to our project. Um, but at some point, obviously, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll provide fulsome responses. We're, we're open to meeting with the community once we have all the comments in and to working with staff towards, uh, towards uh, a decision on this particular project. I'm not going to go over all the details because um, I think Lee did a terrific job. Um, and I'm just going to go through our slides and take the, the 10 minutes that are allotted. And then I'm certainly open to any questions that might uh, arise from, uh, from council, the committee, and, uh, and, and from the floor. So we did file um, applications for official plan amendment zoning bylaw to permit medium density residential that was well covered. They are two properties of substantial size at the terminus of Margaret Drive, but their addresses are actually on Rebecca. So this project actually relates to Rebecca uh, more so than it does inward to the to the Berkeley Square community. Having said that, we're cognizant and interested in looking at the interface between the Berkeley Square development and our clients. The access to this site will be from Market Drive. They will be a, a common element road with a freehold tenure. Um, with addresses on uh, on Rebecca. Those are the lots in close context, as you can see. They're fairly well forward on Rebecca, uh, with Barclay Square, uh, part of Barclay Square to the rear. As you can clearly see, Barclay Square is townhouses. Our proposal is for townhouses. And I pause there. And while I respect the opinions of the community and this council and the local councillors, this strikes me clearly of nimbyism. And I say that with the utmost respect. We are putting townhouses within a cluster of townhouses without direct access. So we need to be cognizant of that as we move forward in the adjudication of this particular application. There's context. Barclay Square is a lovely community of townhouses. Our client seeks to fill in the whole of the donut with additional townhouses. Six of them to be exact. Six of them with two car garages, with two cars within the driveways. So each unit will facilitate four cars. To reduce the number of units, townhouses, would simply be to enlarge the units unnecessarily so, because they are already proposed to be two cars in the, the uh, garage and two cars outside. There's a four-story building on the south side of a Rebecca. Others have pointed this out. There's three-story condominium townhouses to the east of Rebecca, or of, uh, of Dorval. On the west side, recently approved three-story townhouses facing Barclay Square, approved by this council. The hole in the donut. This site has remained single family because the owners did not participate in the original assembly that created Barclay Square. Had these owners participated, those units would have been townhouses, not single family. These are the units in question. My client bought them in a fairly advanced state of some disrepair. The intention is to seek a demolition permit and to replace them with executive townhouses. Barclay Square is of an older vintage, still lovely. The architecture has evolved. It is not uncommon to have some differentiation in architectural styles throughout the city. South on Dorval, Matas is proposing modern townhouses within an area of more traditional townhouses. 
the townhouses on the west side of Dorval that are being proposed or built by, by Fernbrook are very much in keeping to what our client is proposing here. So there can be differentiation, which can result in harmony. My client is not proposing a four to five story building. He could have come in for that. It's on Rebecca. It's transit supportive. It meets the policy guidelines of the, of the, of, of the official plan, of the Halton official plan, places to grow. My client has met with the local councillors, seeking guidance and direction. The decision was to go in with what we believe could and ought to be approved. Three-story townhouses. And I'll get to the four versus three and the exaggerated uh, montage that you were presented with. Again, with the greatest of respect. That's what's across the street from our client's property. We could have come in with that, but we didn't, in respect of Berkeley Square. That's what's to the south and east of our client's property. Appropriate, three-story, built by Matas, approved by this council. Rear lane, garbage, the front. Not inappropriate, well-received, and more of the same occurring in an area of infill, of regeneration, of livable Oakville, addressing all of those policies. This is Barclay Square. I see a building there that, while it is two stories, has a high peak roof. Our client's proposal, yes, it may be at 14 meters, but very much in keeping with the townhouse look, with uh, different architectural styles, more modern of, of this day and age, to provide for more living space, which is what the market demands in this particular location. Our client's proposal is not going to erode the character of this neighborhood, not one iota. In fact, they don't, there is, the interface is going to be vegetation and new landscaping to replace the existing trees. Barclay Square will remain Barclay Square. Our clients are hopeful that, our, that, that the buyers of this, uh, of this development will be welcomed into Barclay Square. There will be no change to the character of this community as a result of building three-story townhouses on Rebecca. No change whatsoever. This is what you approved on the west side of Dorval. Lots of character. Something for the municipality to be proud of. That's what my client's trying to achieve. It's difficult for my client to go back to the uh, 90s and 80s and, and reintroduce older architecture. Architecture evolves. It gets better. It mimics tradition. That's what our client is trying to do. I'm not disparaging Barclay Square. It's just a different era and a different time. And it's not something that the market, from my perspective, has replicated recently. This is what the market is suggesting. The land use policy was well spoken to by Lee. We are seeking an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw. That's the development. There will be green in the front. We are replacing the vegetation to the rear. We want to work with the neighbors. There will be privacy screening. We have put in a landscape plan that seeks to uh, replace the trees and provide visual screening in deference to the concerns that were expressed by the community. These units are about 12 meters removed from the existing development. I ask you not to, well, take a look at the previous slides, but the buildings are here, uh, are removed from, from, from the existing development by 12 meters, way beyond the requirement. Whereas the previous slide, the speaker spoke to all of it being gray. Well, the building itself, as one gentleman mentioned, is 40 meters away. That's a half a football field in an urban context. I don't need to apologize for my client that we're putting townhouses there within 12 meters, fully within the bylaw uh, requirements. Some of the dimensions. That's the architecture. And it's three stories. And we can get into measurements. This is not the time. But it's a three-story development. That's my presentation. I was going to go and look at that juxtaposition photo, um, but I'm going to leave it at the, at, at the fact that it's exaggerated. 
and I ask you to consider it carefully and have your staff do the proper, appropriate analysis, which I'm sure they will do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your information. Uh, you've elicited some questions. Uh, Councillor Hutchins. <coughs> It's it's fine if you if we just we just took them down as we saw them. Uh, we've got Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Demoff, and Councillor Duddick. Who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go first then. Councillor Demoff, do you want to go first? Yeah. Councillor Duddick. Right. Councillor Duddick. I'm going to get a flare soon. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I guess for your presentation, I'm a little bit. Um, disappointed in the um, the tone of the presentation given the tone that was at the public information meeting um, I do take exception to the term nimbyism that is not the case but if you are going to raise that that's specifically the reason it is in their backyard okay that's the problem you have something that you say you're going to put privacy fencing and things. How high is that fence going to be, given the impact these people are going to be feeling as a result? You cite the properties to the south. You were aware that was a comprehensive landing or land use study that we underwent. This did not have a comprehensive land use study associated with it. And the property to the west that you're referring, D&D &D property, I'm sorry, I'm getting into debate, I shouldn't do this. The specific reason why the townhouses were along the Dorval frontage was to protect the people that had single dwellings at the back so that we had a good fit going in. That's transition. What you're providing is not transition, I am sorry. And how you expect to have any kind of tree, twig, shrub, grow on something that is totally concrete is beyond me. So, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have Councilor done that. Doug, there was a question in there. You did ask how high is that privacy fence? Sorry. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> through you, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and with respect to the council, and I do apologize for the tone, but I get passionate about my projects. And and, yes, and, I, and I'm hopeful that people bring accurate information to a floor of council. This is a public forum, and that's what kind of threw me. But I, I do apologize in respect of your comment to me, because you know we went to the public meeting. I fielded a lot of questions. I think I was magnanimous in, in my approach, and I intend to continue to be magnanimous going forward. But it strikes me that some of the photos that have been depicted here are less than forthright, and I'll leave it at that. With respect to the privacy fence, privacy fences in the city of Oak, uh, town of Oakville can be six feet, but our intention is to plant mature trees, as mature as we can, to continue to allow for that privacy so that if somebody is sitting in their backyard, particularly the first unit, they will see trees and they will not see the building. That's the intention going forward. With respect to, uh, and I, uh, with your indulgence, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I thought there was a question there with respect to the, the official plan and how that had evolved. Correct, that had evolved. But any person that has a lot or an amalgamation of lots in Oakville has the right to make an application for an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw because the staff in no way, based on my 30 years of experience, takes that kind of prescriptive approach to designating or zoning every property that they believe might come forward for an infill development. It's up to the proponents to come forward and say, this is what we believe that could occur here, townhouses in a townhouse zone. So they took a risk to come forward and make an application for an official plan amendment and zoning. I happen to believe that it's a fair uh, uh, approach uh, to the development. So I hope that addresses the, the concern with respect to why this particular development wasn't included in the official plan. Many, many, many sites in Oakville were not included in the official plan for redesignation, but you get applications every day for, re for amendments to the official plan. Thank you, Mr. Bruto. Councillor Demoff. Thank you. Um, for your presentation, and, and I, I, I have to say I agree with Kathy. I was, I was a little surprised at the term nimbyism coming in. Given that the property is zoned for single-family dwellings, 
the people who are coming to speak tonight are speaking to the fact that that's what it's zoned and we just recently redid our zoning. So um, one thing I would pr like you to clarify though, you mentioned you met with the local councillors. Did your clients say to you or ex explain to you what we told them in that initial meeting? Through you Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, and I was involved in one of the meetings, the, both of you indicated that we needed to revisit the architecture, which we did. And uh, we looked at the number of stories, which we were let to understand shouldn't be more than three, and we looked at the local area, and that's what we went forward with. So there was an indicator that, that the original plan wasn't correct from an architectural s standpoint, and there were some revisions that were made. Okay, because I, I think we both said at the time that the zoning was for single family and the townhouses were not appropriate for that. And I seem to remember your client saying that he had a different perception, that they had a different perception. And, but I mean, it is zoned for, for two houses there. So um, you, you mentioned north versus south. Um, you know, that the south has already developed like this. But the fact is, is that on Maurice Drive are single family homes. And as someone mentioned, there are already developers looking to consolidate those to, to put more townhouses in. And the whole intent of our official plan was to keep that intensification south of Rebecca. And we've met all of our targets. Mm -hmm. So to presume that someone knows better than, than what was in our official plan uh, is, why would you think that that would make more sense than what we've we spent a lot of time with public consultation. Your clients never came out, to my knowledge, to any of the zoning uh, meetings to ask for a rezoning when we were looking at it. So why weren't they involved at that point? I can, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Uh, my clients weren't in full ownership of the property at that time to be able to make the input that would have been necessary to, to follow the process and have the municipality include these lands for rezoning and redesignation. Uh, that's the simple uh, answer to that question. With respect, um, um, notwithstanding that, I think that uh, uh, official plans and zoning bylaws are fluid documents. Some changes are permitted and some changes are not permitted. Um, I don't suggest for a second that you indicated that, that townhouses are permitted. I, I, I've read the zoning bylaw and uh, they are not permitted under the current zoning bylaw nor they are permitted under the, under the official plan but that's why we're seeking the amendments that we are seeking. There was no assumption of approval. There were a lot of people who came out to meetings that didn't have, that didn't own property to make comments on our zoning bylaw, so your client certainly could have come forward at that time. Um, you didn't have to be a property owner to, in order to comment, on, but I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, the other comment was that architecture has evolved since Sparkly Square was, was built. I'm not quite sure where we came to the point that architecture evolved to 15 feet tall. And I know you keep saying it's three-story, but if you look at the back of that building, it's four stories high. I, I, I mean, it's, it, it's clear on the drawings that there are four stories there. It just happens that the grading is such that, um, but from where those res the residents sitting here tonight, what they're looking at is a four-story building. I, I can respond to that if you wish. It's more of a comment rather than an answer to the question. Perhaps clarification. It is a three-story building and the grades are different. Uh, what the residents will see, there would be a fence, privacy uh, landscaping, and three stories ab above the fence. It is a three-story building and when you look at it from Rebecca, it is a three-story building. We can have the architects discuss it and come up to a, a, whatever the reasonable answer is, but from my understanding and discussions with our architect is that it is a three-story building. Okay, I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Councillor DeMoff, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hutchins, have you changed your mind? Well, I was just... <coughs> Ask one question. It seems to be an awful lot of concrete and things. Where are you going to plant all these other trees that are having the separation considering you're cutting down 13 mature trees? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. i um, trying to go back here a little bit. Hmm. We're, we're, as he does us, we're, we're working with the arborist to try and preserve what we can on the, of the edge trees. And uh, there is sufficient room according to the landscape uh, arborists that, that we can put, 
when I go back, back. In the green space that you see here behind the laneway, there's, there will be an opportunity for uh, tr uh, tree planting as well as on the, on the eastern edge, although that's not as uh, much of a concern. And then in the front, there'll be uh, ample opportunity to, to be able to plant uh, trees as well as on the uh, Margaret Street side. But it is an urban condition. It, it, it will not be single family with the trees that are there today, very clearly. That looks to be very, very narrow, uh, in my opinion. I, I mean, how it looks like you could put a hedge there, but not trees of any size, and they won't grow with that, that smaller space. It, and, and the scale, per, sir, through you, Mr. Chair, the scale probably doesn't do it justice, but we do have a landscape uh, a report, and there is a vegetation uh, plan that has been put forth to the staff for their review as we move forward. And, and I look forward to those comments. If they need, if it needs to be changed, if we need to improve the landscaping, then that's what we will do. Thank you, Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Elder, and then Councillor O'Mara. Thank you, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. You did say um, earlier, I believe, that in fact the fence and the trees would actually block out the view of people looking from your proposed building down to the to the north to the Barclay Square residence. Is that true? If I may, Mr. Chair, to offer clarification. If what I what I said was that if somebody is sitting in their backyard rather than on the second floor, if somebody is sitting in, in the backyard in the Barclay Square, they would be seeing the privacy fence as there is now as well as vegetation and the tops of townhouses uh, what you're saying is they would not be able to see for sure anybody sitting on the balcony looking down at them that's what you're saying the balcony the elevation of the balcony would be they would be peering into the backyards and if I presume if they have an interest in looking at a distance in somebody else's backyard uh, which is not an uncommon condition in the town of Oakville, then yes, they could see into people's backyards. Because I thought you said they wouldn't see, wouldn't be able to yeah. see. But what you were saying is if you're sitting in a chair and you're looking through a five-foot fence, you probably that's wouldn't right. see anything. Because you're enjoying your privacy if you're barbecuing or with friends. That's the privacy that we're most concerned with from a planning perspective. So the trees you're going to plant, how tall are they going to be? The, the arborist will give us the direction that we need, but uh, mature trees could be in the range of five to, to seven, eight meters. So it'd be about 15, 16 feet. So if you're sitting in the backyard, they'll be at a reasonable level of maturity to provide privacy. So you're going to plant mature trees? That's good, great. Uh, is that what you're saying you will be planting? A, a sufficient caliber to, to be able to be at, at, at uh, 15, 16 feet, yes. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. And uh, we'll, we will take direction from the town of Oakville as a mitigating measure for privacy. Normally the trees that are going to be that higher, about 30 years, will all be gone. But uh, anyhow. There, are some, there are some decorative species that, 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 are, that, that, that range from 15 to 20 and are slow growing, and that's kind of mature state. So you can, you can get them at, at a reasonable mature state. But I'll leave it to the arborists, your arborists and ours, to, to have that discussion. It, it scares me what I see proposed because I, snow removal is one thing and those little whippets that will be planted will be gone in the first winter, you know. That's, that's I, I know what you're saying, but I think in, re in reality, I hope you take another look at this whole, the dimensions you have here altogether. Thank you. I, I take that under advisement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Councillor O'Meara. <coughs> Thank you. I, I, um, I know you said earlier that you've been doing this for about 30 years, and, and, and I respect that, and, and this council has been doing this collectively for, for quite some time as well. So uh, when we show up and we see an audience packed like this over an issue, uh, it makes me ask the question, do you feel that yourself and your clients have done a good enough job addressing their concerns? Through you, um, Mr. Chairman. I've looked at all the concerns and following the, the Public Information Centre. And we aren't completed the dialogue. It's early in the process. This is the public meeting. There's going to be a staff report. They're reviewing all of our reports. I'm reviewing all the comments I heard this evening. They're pretty consistent with what's been written and what we've seen at the PIC. 
The answer to the question that's being posed is just leave it alone. Let's just put bungalows. That would satisfy everybody. My client would go away and, 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 and that would probably appease everybody. That's total sort of saying, you know what, you're right, we're wrong. Can't do that. I'm not instructed to do that. I don't think it's appropriate to do that. These are bungalows, single family of, of, of a different era that are, from my perspective, and I'm sure council have seen it, you've seen it, that are, that are not right, but are uh, suitable for redevelopment of the right type. I heard at the public meeting, well, why don't you do four units? And, you know, I don't like to just throw darts. I looked at the site, and I think six is appropriate because they're two car garages. They're not single car garages. They're two car garages, so they're wide enough. They fit the site. I think we can work together on privacy. I think we can work together on setbacks. I think we can work together on height, on some building materials, on changing the, the configuration of the livable space and the top floor. I heard that comment that the Juliet balconies from the washroom were overlooking uh, Barclay Square. We can work with that. We can work with garbage. We can work with traffic. We can work with circulation so that the vehicles from this development don't enter into Park Barclay Square. So there's an education program that gets put forth. Um, so to answer your question is there is a lot of latitude to continue to work with the community. To this point, I think we've done a good job of putting forward an application that we think is compatible with the community because it's not four stories, it's not five stories, it's not six. That may be what somebody else might do. That's not where we started. We started with what we think is appropriate, three-story townhouses of sufficient width. Um, is there room for improvement? Yeah, there's always room for improvement because dialogue inevitably brings improvement. And that's what I look forward to doing. And I'm hopeful that council, and I, and, I, and, I, and I know this council will keep an open mind, allow the opportunity to continue to work. But if the answer is, like you've heard tonight, that it should be two single family units, then in the opinion of the community, and perhaps your opinion, is that we haven't done a good enough job. Thank you. Any other members of council with questions? Councillor Giddings. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for coming out, Mr. Bruto. My uh, pleasure. Question for you. You had mentioned that earlier on that if you were to reduce the number of units, the corresponding action would be to make them larger. Would one of the options or an alternative option not be to reduce the number of units and instead of making them larger to increase the green space or to re remove the uh, footage on the area? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's, it's a very good point that you make and we've looked at standards for townhouse units in terms of green space and for this site. And I don't rely just on myself, I rely on our landscape uh, architect and on our architect as to whether this is a good facility fit here and they're telling me that it is. Will we go back and, and look at that option to say, you know, fewer units, does it improve uh, the site fit? Then that's something that we will look at. Um, our architect has looked at it. There hasn't been that kind of interaction as yet because we wanted to go through tonight's meeting to, to receive all the comments and the comments of council, but I'll take that uh, under advisement, go back to our, our client and, and pose the question. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, Mr. Bruto, I, I just have a closing question. For, oh, sorry, Councillor Grant. I, I really, through you, Mr. Chair, hate to drag this out further, but given that you're taking comments under your wing, um, you, you mentioned quite a bit and rely heavily on the idea that architecture has evolved in some fashion through the years. We, we have this thing now called an urban footprint where a lot of buildings are actually moved closer to the sidewalk. In fact, across the street from you, which you pointed out earlier, the buildings are practically right on top of the sidewalk. If the concern here is that we have no space in the back, I'm wondering why the architect had never thought why not move everything forward in this evolving architecture style? It's a, through you, Mr. Chair, it's a, it's a good comment and, I, and I'll take it back to our architect. We uh, were cognizant of the widening that's required. Um, if we can move the buildings a, a little further to the front, 
then uh, that's something that we would certainly uh, be happy to take a look at. There are some provisions in the bylaw, as was noted earlier in the in the presentation slide, that we are seeking uh, some reduction in the front yard. But if uh, if that is an invitation to continue to look at at at, at, at uh, reducing the frontage, then that's something I'm I'm happy to take back to the architect, and and I will do so, and work with staff, of course. Thank you. And you do realize it is four stories in the back. Because when you say that, well, you've got a fence and then three stories, there's got to be something behind that fence. It, <laughs> through you, Mr. Chair. It, it, it's, it's a debate uh, that's very, very technical in nature, and I, and I leave it to the architects to tell me this is a three-story building. I think once the experts get together and put the information together, it'll get disseminated from your urban design people, ours, to the community and ultimately to council, which is where the decision's going to rest. So I can assure you, we'll have a clear answer as we, we plow through this process. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Councillor Khan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Um, at this meeting, obviously, there's no decision made. We get input from yourself and from the community and from all the stakeholders. Um, in the subsequent meeting, we'll come back from a staff, will make a report. Uh, but what I found really remarkable was that you kept coming back to the idea that, you know, this was our starting point. You know, we've, we've considered it and we're open and this is our starting point. My question to you is that I, you might have raised it, but was there a starting point that you considered that it would have been less units? And are you, are you telling us that you're willing to negotiate in the number of units when you keep saying that this is a starting point? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not in a position to negotiate at this particular time. We will review lesser units. I need instructions from my client. The perspective that we take on projects is we say to the client and the architect, here are the provisions of the bylaw. The architect says, well, we have a rear lane condition, so the units can be 20 feet wide to contain two car garages. That's the starting point. So we look at how many we can fit. Do we have sufficient side yard setback, front yard setback, and the number that evolves out of that iterative process is six units. So, so yeah. that, when I, sorry, sorry go ahead. I, 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 to, to, to interject. So when we come up with six, it isn't simply saying, you know, that's the wish list and the starting point. We, we drilled right down to what we believe is suitable for this site based on the input from all of our technical experts. It wasn't as if we threw six at it and tried to defend it. This is what fits on the site. So we will look at less units, but obviously my client needs to make a decision as to whether he, he wants to stay the course or work with less units, more landscaping. So these are all things that I will take back to my client. I appreciate that you don't have instructions. But during the design process, mm -hmm. was there ever a plan envisioned or drawings made that had less than six units? No. Okay, so this was your starting point that you came to the council with, and you're going to go back and speak to your client and ask them whether they would consider less? Because you said that you don't, have, you don't have the authority right now, you don't have instructions, but you will speak to your client about this. To be clear, Mr. Chair, through you, this process did, wasn't... There were a number of sketches that evolved to the six units. So it wasn't, I mean, we looked at any number of, 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 of units. We looked at access from, from Rebecca, for instance. We looked at Stacktown as we considered the four stories. And after we distilled all of that, we came to a conclusion that the six units were appropriate for the site. So it's not to say that we didn't have uh, sketches of, of less units. But when you look at the efficiency of the site, and, and, and to be very clear, you look at the economics. My client needs to look at the economics as well. Um, the decision was made that from a facility fit, appropriate, economically, appropriate. My client needs to make the determination to work along with council and, 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 the, uh, and the community to determine whether less units is viable uh, for him, right? And that's something I'll, I will take back. I'm not going to uh, argue with you here, but my concern here is you're, you're sending out mixed messages. On the one hand, you're saying this is a starting point. This is, we started with six. I'll go back to my client, see if they'll consider it. And then you say, but six is appropriate. So I, I'm getting I'm not being be, clear then, and, obviously. And, and the mayor is going to shut me down for, for being argumentative. No, no, no. And I'll squeeze in whatever I can before he shuts me down. But I would highly recommend that you take it back to your client and consider re reconfiguring, reducing the number of units, 
and negotiate and deal with our staff and satisfy the stakeholders and then come back to us with a more appropriate proposal. I'll take that as constructive input and I'm, I'm, I don't believe you're being argumentative at all. And, um, perhaps I'm trying. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I perhaps didn't articulate it as well as I could. There were a number of, of iterations. We landed on six because we felt that it was appropriate. It's not a starting point per se. Maybe I jumped on on, on answering your question. It's, it's, I mean, we started this process almost a year ago. So this is not new. This is uh, developed and all the studies were done on the basis of six. So um, the process tonight is when the formal process actually starts. We're hearing from public, we're hearing from council. It's, it's all good input and, and we'll take it back to my, to my, uh, my client. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying yes. I have to take instructions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan, for whatever that was. <laughs> Councillor DeMoff again. Uh, just, just very briefly, I know your client mentioned when we first met with them too that it, the economic um, outcome was driving a lot of what they wanted to do on this site. Um, and you've mentioned that again tonight. But I, I have to tell you, well, you we had a very... Uh, productive meeting with the residents a few months ago and you were very gracious and you listened to all the comments and and at that time you said I'll take all of this back to my client mm -hmm. and I was I was disappointed tonight that we haven't seen any any kind of change or any any kind of um, recognition of all the concerns which are exactly the same ones that were brought up two months ago so I think you've got a very good sense of where the residents sit and and from the questions where council sits so I really do hope you are taking them back to your client and that we won't be looking at the same thing uh, going forward if I if I may respond to that uh, through you mr. chair I have been listening I was at that meeting I did take back information to my client there were comments made, written comments and, and follow-up comments that we should be looking at two units. So that kind of throws you right back to square one and say, well, what can we logically expect in terms of a negotiation? And I thought, you know what, let's, let's wait till council weighs in, take all the information, that's really what we're doing, take all the information, put your input together, which you've been very clear about, and the community, and put it all in the hopper and let's see what we can come back with. That's the only reason we haven't uh, changed designs. I could have come in with, you know, something, you know, five or four or two. Uh, that's just not what I, I like to do. I like to hear all the comments comprehensively, uh, get all the circulation comments. I think we're almost through all the circulation comments from all the internal and external agencies. We put it all together and, and we'll have a more fruitful discussion, I believe. But I'm listening and um, and, and I understand what the, what the concern is, but with to be very clear, again, in terms of the two units for my client, that's not a non-starter. Okay, thank you. Hopefully, council's done trying to negotiate. Tonight. <laughs> um, Mr. Bruto, thank you very much for your information and your time. Thank you. And uh, Madam Clerk, is there another delegation? Um, I'll poll the audience. I see at one hand. Are there others? Uh, Ms. Brock? Good evening. Uh, my name is Karen Brock, and uh, I'm uh, representing Oakville Green Conservation Association tonight. I feel like I haven't been here for a long time, but I did want to comment uh, briefly on the urban forest canopy. As most of you know, Oakville Green has been involved in working with the town and many citizens addressing the issue of challenges to the urban forest canopy. Um, I think this development certainly underscores uh, a lot of the challenges that our, our community faces as a whole, as well as the challenge that, that face council. Um, I want to point out that Oakville Green is not um, against infill development because of course there are lots of efficiencies and certainly as many of us age uh, this is a, a could be a desirable uh, location to be and to have access to downtown um, but what I do want to point out is that uh, there is a difference between Barclay Square and this particular development, proposed development, and that is in the pictures that you saw of Barclay Square there were large mature trees 
and the reason that is is because there is going to be there was green space planned for these large mature trees and when I say that I'm not talking about lollipop trees and decorative trees but trees that will reach two and three stories high much like the ones that exist on this property um, uh, that we're speaking to tonight. So of these 13 trees, all are proposed to be removed. And as you saw in Mr. Uh, Bruto's picture of those two individual town, or sorry, individual homes now, they're surrounded in the rear by a two-story, two, maybe even three-story canopy. All of that will be gone. I do also want to point out, as many of the residents here will attest, um, that this particular area, even though slated for infill development, has lost a dr very dramatically a large number of trees, not only on the DND lands, but at St. Thomas Aquinas, um, where many large mature trees were removed. Um, I do want to point out that I think the scouts have left, but I think it's very safe to say that um, um, these trees, even if promised and planted, um, are likely not to survive. Uh, I do know that the town has minimum standards for soil volume, which um, will um, sort of ensure that trees do survive if they're planted there. Uh, and looking at Mr. Bruto's um, uh, picture of the four meter, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the laneway appears to be four meters wide, uh, a guesstimate and a quick look uh, indicates that the green space in behind is only going to be a meter on the east side and probably half a meter on the west side. So. Um, even though I'm not an arborist, I can pretty much uh, say that even if a tree is planted there, it won't be su support a large stature tree. So um, I would question any promises of planting large stature trees that are going to uh, survive or thrive in that space. So um, again, I urge council and staff to um, look at what is going to survive in that space and, and strongly suggest that if anything's going to be planted, green space is going to, more green space is going to be needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brock, for your information. All right. Um, the next thing that would be in order would be a motion to receive the comments of the public so that staff can uh, take them into account. Who wants to be that mover? Councillor DeMoff, all those in favor? Post if any, and that is carried. Thank you, everyone. Now, at a guess, you may not be fascinated by the rest of the agenda. And, and so I will call a little five-minute recess. I'll call it a bio break so that we're not doing it on your behalf. But the result will be that you'll be able to leave without disturbing or feeling guilty about disturbing us or anything like that. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, it means a lot to us to have company, even if it is uh, this kind of thing. So thank you very much for being here. All right, I'll call the meeting back to order. And uh, Council, I propose to move now to item number six out of consideration for the Trafford Crescent residents who may be here uh, anxiously awaiting, they are here, anxiously awaiting the fate of their item. Uh, and if I don't see an objection, that's where we're going. Your, Councilor Robinson? Your Worship, yes, I could speak to that. I've talked to the residents, they've read the report, they're happy and satisfied with it, and none of them want to speak to us this evening, so I would move approval. Thank you, Councilor Robinson. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed if any? Thank you for not applauding. <laughs> <laughs> it's technically against our rules. <laughs> All right, um, Council will resume the agenda as published. And uh, because I wish to speak to item number four, I'd like to pass the chair to Acting Mayor Duddock. Thank you. Um, we are now on uh, item number four, I believe. Is that correct? OK, I'm the chair, yeah. Um, are we getting a presentation from staff? I do believe we are. Thank you, uh, um, members of council. Um, I'm pleased this evening to uh, present the update to the Heritage Planning uh, th three-year work plan. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, the, the plan reflects input from Heritage Planning staff and also your Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee. The photos on the front slide um, 
actually represent some of the initiatives that uh, we're very pleased with that were either in progress now or to come. Uh, the first two buildings at the top uh, took advantage of the Heritage Grant Program in 2014 um, to receive some grant money for repairs to the stucco on the left and also the front porch on the right. And the bottom photo is the streetscape of uh, First and Second Street. I think that's First Street. And that is an initiative that uh, we have initiated this year and we hope to, uh, or last year, and we hope to uh, complete this year. So my presentation uh, this evening will be very brief. It will focus on uh, the three topic areas that are in the second slide. And that is the areas of focus in our work plan. Uh, we'll touch briefly on the 2014 accomplishments and we'll look ahead to 2015 to 17 initiatives with a focus on our 2015 priorities. Um, I believe the clerk has provided you with a lovely colored version of Appendix A. I hope that you have that in front of you. Um, and that will be beneficial um, when we move through the presentation. So the areas of focus again are uh, in four areas. Identify and protecting heritage resources. Uh, that's what I refer to as the day-to-day -day, uh, work that the heritage planning staff uh, do related to permit review, uh, dealing with demolition requests and proactive designations. Uh, that's the turning of the crank and it does take a lot of staff time and in fact um, I noted to the Heritage Oakville Committee this year the number of permits has continued to rise in the four years that I've been with the town and we're up close to uh, 70 to 80 per year. The second area is streamlining policy and procedures. Uh, a couple of recent examples that were successes in the past would be um, the heritage delegation to staff, which has been great, and uh, our street naming protocols, which now include um, heritage uh, input. Undertaking studies and reports related to heritage is the third focus area. Uh, those are the bigger projects that typically require uh, funding support through capital um, from yourself uh, as council, and a, and a recent example would be the, um, the Downtown Heritage Conservation District, which was a success uh, several years ago. And lastly, promoting heritage conservation through outreach and education is the fourth focus area. Things that we do in there would be support for doors open, uh, some of our um, real estate seminars that uh, uh, we have had in the past, that was another one that uh, was a success in 2014, and also the Heritage Awards um, we put a lot of work into the Heritage Awards as well. So very quickly, our 2014 accomplishments, um, the four that I've highlighted on the first slide, I would say are, our, are the ones that we really are taking pride in, and that's the implementation of the Heritage Grant Program. The first year was 2014. We had a lot of interest um, to uh, try to divvy up the 80,000 that Council has endorsed. And uh, we're seeing similar interest in our 2015 program as well. Early in the year, uh, Council endorsed the Cultural Heritage Landscape Strategy. Uh, we will be moving forward on that to, in future years. And I, I believe the Mayor would like to speak to that tonight. And I'm certainly open to uh, ideas or where we should be heading. Um, initiating the update to the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District, I mentioned that started in the fall of last year with the... Uh, um, retention of a consulting firm to assist and much of the grunt work with that will be in the first six months of this year and we hope to present that to Council uh, early in the fall. And very proud of the designations that Council has endorsed related to the Oakville Arena and the Metro Marine. So those were two projects that we were exceedingly proud of. Other accomplishments included the real estate seminar I mentioned. Um, well received both the one we did in 2012 and also in 2014. Um, heritage inspections, we've streamlined that process internally and made it a, um, a factor in all of the processes that we do to so ensure that inspections are done. And there were also support for other planning initiatives for others, the Downtown Streetscape and Cultural Hub, which will be brought forward, I believe, in the next uh, month or so. The Oakville Arena Redevelopment, which is ongoing, and the Burnham Fort Road Character Study, which will actually be presented next. And that's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes uh, from your heritage planning staff, supporting those other projects. So moving ahead to uh, 2015 to 17, I'm not going to go into detail on this colorful spreadsheet. Um, just to point out again, uh, as we've done in past years, the completed projects are in green. The ongoing projects are highlighted in blue. And where you see yellow highlight, those are either new initiatives or updates to the timing or status. So if Council has any questions on any of those and why they've landed in certain years, I can certainly go into that. 
Our 2015 priorities, again, is to complete the update to the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation, the continued implementation of the Heritage Grant Program. Again, this is the second year of that program. As you remember, it's a three-year pilot, so next year will be the final year, and then we will be reporting back to Council on whether we should continue that um, as an ongoing um, initiative. As part of that, we hope to update the designation guide, which you know, references um, the importance of heritage conservation and will include in that um, information on the grant program. We'll be looking for other outreach opportunities um, through your livable Oakville update. Um, there's been a lot of out outreach that's already occurred, but um, some of the next steps are to go into the schools and talk to the children about uh, the importance of planning, and we hope to uh, partner with that to talk about the importance of heritage planning. And we want to resurrect the plaque program as well this year. So again, I'm open to uh, any question you might have, but I'm hoping that Council will endorse um, this resolution tonight and receive our work plan. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Are there any questions for staff before I look to the Mayor for his input? Okay, seeing not, Your Worship, I believe this is the time. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, you know, we on Council are very, very proud of our heritage planners and the work that you do. And, um, and we place a lot of importance on what you do. And, um, and you mentioned uh, our joint interest in cultural heritage landscapes. They are a defining element of our town. And the recently completed cultural heritage landscape strategy brings a greater understanding, brought us a greater understanding of our ability to protect in that area. We've already protected our waterfront and valleys which are identified as our natural system. And the report uh, notes that further work on our harbors uh, needs to be done. However, we have many other major open space areas which are key to defining the landscape of Oakville. And given the size of your existing heritage program, uh, I have to assume that internal resources are already at their limit. And accordingly, if this cultural heritage landscape work can't be completed in 2015, we need a report to the Budget Committee on funding required to complete this review in 2015. And so, Council, I would ask you to move the staff recommendation uh, with an addendum, with a second piece that would say, we request staff to undertake a review of the town's major open space areas in order to determine if they should be appropriately designated as a cultural heritage landscape. And further, if the work cannot be completed in 2015, staff are requested to report to the Budget Committee on the required resources to complete this study in 2015. Okay, having heard, are there any questions of that uh, addition to the motion? Do I have a mover? Councillor Elgar. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. I will pass the gavel back to your worship. Sure. Ah. <laughs> Just on a, on a point of order, I, I actually, it was the mayor, I think since the mayor had passed the chair to you, I should, it should actually be uh, moved by, uh, by our mayor. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just happy that we got her done. Okay. <laughs> maybe, we could have a, maybe we could put that in the minutes. So the, mayor the, the, the clerk has empowered to make these corrections. All right. Um, that brings us to number five, the Burnham Thorpe Road Character and Environmental Assessment Study. And uh, Lynn, we're ready. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council and members of the public. My name is Lynn Rogers, the Transportation Engineer in the Engineering Construction Department and the Project Lead for the Bernathorpe Road, Character Road and Class Environmental Assessment Study. I am here this evening to present to you the study process and recommendations for your consideration. This study was led by the Community Development Commission, which included Engineering Construction, Development Services and Planning Services. Technical support was provided throughout this study by our consultants MMM group. 
On the screen before you is an overview of our, of our presentation today. I will begin with some background information, discuss public engagement, review the alternative designs, and also the evaluation process. And then I will outline the preferred design. At, lastly, I will outline the uh, next steps of the study. The process to determine and implement Burnham Thorpe Road is a long-term process. It has been broken down into four phases, which is before you. The first phase is the North Oakville Secondary Plan, whereby Burnham Thorpe Road is described as a character road. And with the construction of the future William Halton Parkway, which has been referred to in the past as the new North Oakville Transportation Corridor, um, Burnham Thorpe Road is set to replace Oh, sorry, William Halton Parkway, which is set to replace the existing Burnham Thorpe Road um, regional road function. The second phase of the study is this study here, the character road study, which is described in the North Oakville Secondary Plan to develop the road design, including the right-of-way width and facilities within the right-of-way. The third phase, af um, after the approved character, if Council so wishes to approve the character road study, includes various policy updates. These include road rationalization, given that Burnham Thorpe Road is currently a regional road, official plan updates to ensure that the right-of-way policies are consistent, um, and also financial policies to establish how we're going to fund this roadway. The last phase is implementation, which includes property acquisition, detail, design, and finally construction. As I, mentioned today, as I mentioned, the existing Burnham Thorpe Road is a regional road. To accommodate North, growth in North Oakville, a new regional road, um, previously referred to as the new North Oakville Transportation Corridor, and now named William Halton Parkway, will be constructed by Halton Region, just north of the existing Burnham Thorpe Road and will address future east-west travel demands in North Oakville. Additionally, improvements to Dundas Street from four to six lanes will be implemented to also address these travel demands. Once constructed and in service, a William Halton Parkway will replace the regional road function and the remaining portions of Burnham Thorpe as identified in purple on the screen uh, will be transferred to the town and be designated a character road as described in the North Oakville East Secondary Plan. Burnham Thorpe Road will retain its name, and this designation will promote it to transition to a vibrant and pedestrian-friendly street as development occurs along the corridor. Currently, there are several farms and rural residential properties along the roadway with some commercial and some institutional facilities. Uh, the integrity of the current built form and cultural heritage landscape should be maintained or enhanced where possible while ensuring that the development is accommodated and diverse modes of transportation are promoted. The implementation of the North Oakville's master plan will see that the development of a vibrant, compact community along this portion of corridor and a ro new road design is needed to support this tra approved transition. Um, the future land use context, again, as approved through the secondary plan is before you. It includes um, several uh, land use contexts and is uh, very diverse. Um, the land use is along Burnham Thorpe Road uh, range from a general urban, which is predominantly residential, to transitional areas, which essentially provide an interface or a buffer between the employment district and the residential land uses. Um, an urban core or urban core uh, land uses, which is primarily high density and also employment, which is an employment area which include industrial and office development with some limited retail and service commercial. As I mentioned, um, the established new vision for areas north of Dundas include Burnham Thorpe Road as an urban community, one that is vibrant, pedestrian friendly, and transit supportive. 
The physical design of the road and its streetscape elements, as well as the built forms adjacent to it, defines the character of the roadway through visual experiences they create. The key to maintaining the authenticity of Burnham Thorpe Corridor is ensuring that the new elements are distinct and definable and where appropriate sen sensitive to the existing character of the road. This study determines both the function and character of Burnham Thorpe Road as parcels along the corridor develop. The problems and opportunities detailed in the slide relate to Burnham Thorpe's future function and character and are based on a review of existing conditions as well as the town of Oakville's vision and goals for the study corridor. As you see before you, um, the study itself looked at both function and character of the road. Um, again, what is the role of Burnham Thorpe? Who's going to use it, since there are several users within the right-of-way? And in terms of character, will it continue to be a rural cross-section, urban, or a combination? Will the sections along Burnham Thorpe, because of the several land uses along this corridor, be treated the same, or will there be a change? And also, is there a distinct or common element along the length of this corridor? Uh, the study uh, began in uh, 2013, and uh, at, as you can see, several phases of the study um, were included. As part of that, there were several engagement, public engagement sessions throughout. Um, one included the first public information session in early June to establish the, pro the context and problem opportunity, the second in April of 2014 to look at the alternatives, and finally today um, here at, at PND Council. Other public engagement sessions include technical agencies, committees, and meetings, two stakeholder meetings with uh, focus groups to discuss the um, problems and opportunities and also the preferred um, design, two public open houses, a project-specific website, and also social media alerts. Due to the varied land uses and densities expected along the Burnham Thorpe Corridor with the implementation of the uh, North Oakville East Secondary Plan, three sections of this corridor were identified. Um, first is to the west is uh, the west section, which is primarily um, residential and low to medium density. Uh, second is the core section, which is a high, high density and mixed use, which is along the Trafalgar Road corridor. And lastly, the medium density um, section, uh, which you see here in the orange, which is um, a transitional section, which is, like I mentioned, medium density and mixed use. A distinct set of road design alternatives were established and developed for these sections to meet the unique needs. The west section is bounded by 16 Mile Creek to the west and William Halton Parkway to the east. In this section of the corridor, the land use designation primarily allow for low to medium density residential development with some mixed use along um, fronting Burnham Thorpe Road is encouraged with allowable bu building heights that range from two to five stories. The cross sections before you illustrate the alternative road designs that were considered uh, for the west section and considered the land uses um, proposed for that. The alternatives aim to minimize environmental impact of the right of way while at the same time considering a range of on street parking and active transportation options. As you see before you, there are both rural and urban cross sections. The core sections is next and is defined by the Trafalgar uh, Road Urban Core Land Use Designation within the North Oakville Secondary Plan. It extends east and west from the Burnham Thorpe Road intersection with Trafalgar Road and is expected to be or expected to experience higher uh, rates of urban development in this corridor. The designation al allows for a range of land uses including buildings up to 20 stories. These cross sections um, for the core section, illustrate alternative road designs that were considered for the core section. These alternatives reflect the need for an urban cross section and provides an attractive pedestrian environment while at the same time um, providing safe cycling facilities accommodating, um, well, at the same time accommodating uh, higher uh, volumes of traffic.
the last section is the transitional section of the corridor and is located directly east and west of the core section. In the secondary plan, these sections are primarily designated transitional area and allow for a range of land uses. The density of the development is expected to be lower than that of the urban core while still providing an urban and pedestrian friendly environment. The cross sections proposed for this um, transitional area uh, illustrate, or uh, sorry, uh, were considered uh, compatible, uh, were considered for its compatibility to the adjacent land uses and also with its compatibility to its um, proximity to the core section. Alternatives for this section uh, ensure that the continuity um, is there for both pedestrians, cyclists, and also traffic facilities. At the first public information meeting, a set of draft, or draft evaluation criteria was presented. This was also refined through public consultation. The final evaluation criteria are organized into seven categories, as shown um, on the screen or before you. Um, they include operational, uh, sustainable transportation, natural environment, urban design, socioeconomic, cultural environment, and also finance, financial. Um, each of the ro alternative road designs for the west, core, and transitional sections were evaluated against these criteria to determine the preferred design. Discussions with members of the project team, technical agencies, and stakeholders also help refine the results in, of the valuation and determine um, the categories that would be of most importance. Um, the evaluation criteria uh, in, uh, identified this before you, which is the preliminary preferred alternative for the length of the Burnham Thorpe Road corridor. Specifically to the west in the low to medium density area, um, alternative four was selected. This is an urban road design um, with wide boulevards, um, bump out parking, and also buffered bike lanes. This design is um, expected to promote active transportation and is expected to also support the small scale um, uh, commercial land uses, also, but also at the same time limiting the right of way to 22 meters to minimize um, any adverse environmental impacts. In the high density area, um, also the high density mixed use area, the core section, alternative one was selected. This alternative also includes buffered bike lanes, wide boulevards um, uh, to create an inviting pedestrian environment and also to promote active forms of transportation. Off-peak parking is also available to provide flexibility in allowing for four lanes of traffic during peak hours. Lastly, in the medium density area, the transitional section, alternative two is preferred. This, sec um, this cross section includes bump out parking lanes and will support adjacent commercial land uses, while the buffered bike lane is consistent along the corridor um, and is a configuration, again, to support active transportation throughout. In terms of the next step of the next steps for this study, um, if council wishes to approve the um, environmental study report, we will be um, moving forward with a public commenting period to end March 12, 20, the 30 day period to end on March 12, 2015. And then the final um, environmental study report is to be um, completed by spring of 2015. Um, as I mentioned, there is uh, the long process in terms of trying, uh, of implementing um, Burnham Thorpe Road. Um, and so there are, uh, following that, there are some policy amendments to be made or policy updates, which include road rationalization in, um, in uh, inclu including work with Halton Region. Also, uh, the official plan updates to um, in ensure that the right-of-way policies as recommended in the um, environmental study report are consistent with the official plan. This is proposed uh, to be included as part of the official plan review. And lastly, um, fi the financial component um, proposed to
began in the fall of 2015, uh, which is with the development charge bylaw update. I should note that the estimated um, cost of the projects, um, cost of the project, which is widening and urbanization of 16 mile, or sorry, sorry, of Burnham Thorpe Road between 16 Mile Creek and 9th Line is estimated to be approximately $13.2 million. Elements of this plan is to be secured to the extent possible through development planning process, um, development charges, and also uh, budget capital funds. Thank you for your time. And here to answer any thank questions. Thank you, Lynn. Councillor Elgar has a question. Uh, uh, yes, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. and. Uh, we, we, you and I have talked about the proposal. I was wondering if you would be uh, able to put up your recommendation, which you have redone, I believe, for everyone. I can speak to an amendment based on our discussion. Yes, please. Uh, so our discussion with, or my discussion with um, Council Algar spoke to uh, looking at the bicycle, or sorry, the active transportation facilities within um, this corridor. Um, and uh, looking at um, enhancing it further to what is being proposed. And um, based on our discussion, um, uh, the, we're looking to add a multi-use, or sorry, in replace of the standard sidewalk, enhancing it um, to a multi-use path, so, which is some of the discussion that we had. So the proposed uh, additional recommendation is that during the detailed design process, staff include a multi-use path in lieu of a standard sidewalk within the transitional areas along one side of the corridor. Yes, one side. Uh, I'd like to thank you for that. Now, if, if maybe we can roll back just a little bit. Sure. I see a letter here from a, a lawyer stating that this new road is actually fragmenting the client's property. Could you maybe go back and show the road that you're talking about. I, I know what's happened here. They think it's the proposed re redesignation of what's now called the uh, the William Halton Parkway. I think. That's correct. So the property that um, is uh, mentioned in that letter from Weirfolds is actually a 263 Burnham Thorpe Road West, which is, if I have my arrow correctly, is right in this area where uh, the curved linear section of William Halton Parkway is. So it actually, um, it relates to the William Hart Halton Parkway, the new North Oakville Transportation Corridor, um, and not the Burnham Thorpe Road um, Corridor. I appreciate that, because that may have, uh, you know, I, I think actually when I first read it, I thought it was the new William uh, Parkway also when I first read what we were doing. We're just dealing with the existing Burnham Thorpe Road and how we're going to reconstruct it. That's right, the remnant pieces as a result of William Halton Parkway being built. Now, with regard to the, uh, you threw out that small number, 13.2 million, mm -hmm. do we know what portion of that will be development charges and what portion we, the existing residents, will be contributing to? That Not number? at this time. I mean, we are looking at uh, development along this corridor. So we, like I mentioned, we are looking to see um, elements of, uh, of this project, and including um, property acquisition, construction, et cetera, through the development um, application process, as well as development charges and, um, if, if needed, the capital budget program. But at this time, with the portions have not been determined as of yet. Okay. So, so the next question is just for clarification. So what we, have, what we will have going forward will be a fully dedicated bike lane for the cyclists that want to go straight through. Correct. And we will also have a shared sidewalk and bicycle lane uh, so that the people, younger ch children can uh, ride on that portion of which, which is a divided um, curb, right? They, like there's no way cars will be around that area at all. That's correct. So we will have two dedicated uh, bicycle lanes that are buffered. So it's not just the bike lane, it's, there's also an additional buffer to that within the 24 meter right of way. And then, um, on one side of the road, there will be essentially an, a wider sidewalk, but we'll, we call it a multi-use trail that is um, separated uh, from vehicular traffic by the barrier curb. I thank you very much for that. Thanks. If I may add, with the amendment, we do have to uh, change the second recommendation for a public commenting to start on February 19th in order to uh, um, amend the public notice in time for... Yeah. Alrighty process. then. 
You've got a lot of work ahead of you tonight. There's many questions. Uh, Councillor Adams, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Demoff, Councillor Hutchins. Anyone else? That'll get you going. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Adams. Would you mind going to your next steps page? Absolutely. Thank you very much for laying out the policy amendment uh, component of that uh, clearly on the, on this slide. Uh, so can you just confirm for me, so the, the final piece there on the financial policy, um, it being included within the development charge bylaw update and review means that it would then go into our 10-year capital forecast, assuming that it's within the 10-year period. Are you able to give us some indication as to whether it's likely to be early in the in a 20-year horizon, late in a 20-year horizon, midway? Uh, I mean, I know that it has to go through that whole process, but are we are we likely looking at the end of the 20-year horizon or somewhere in between? Any kind of sense? Well, as you know, the development of the Burnham Thorpe and actually North Oakville corridor is a long-term vision, you know, a, a, almost a 20-year vision. So as part of that development will come the the implementation of Burnham Thorpe Road. So I do see it as a long-term um, exact timing. I would say 10 to 20 uh, is more likely. Okay, so it's into the, the it's outer beyond, end yeah. of that period. That's, right. that, that's really what I'm trying to get. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to peg you down to a particular year. I just... I'm trying to get so when when the conversation comes up I can say this is something that's farther out yes. not next year's development project for example. That's correct and as I mentioned in the first slide it is a long-term process so there are there's a lot of work ahead of us after this should, should council wish to approve again with the policy updates um, uh, in order to move forward to that point of looking at it as part of and a, it's any of process. course subject to changes in the rate of development in North Oakville uh, so if things sped up or things slowed down we would be Absolutely. moving the project up or down depending on that thank you very much for You're that welcome. information thank you councillor councillor Noel <clears throat> thank you from uh, councillor Adams question sounds like he plans on being budget chair for quite a long time <laughs> um, actually he he touched on most of my questions okay. regarding timing I was curious what the anticipated timing was for the part what you saw on the in your crystal ball in terms of uh, what the phasing looks like and such for when we might actually see something like this come to pass so um, to be clear then there's no none of the none of the groundwork or the infrastructure will take place until such a point as the development warrants it in that area correct we're not going to be looking at like Oak Park Boulevard when it was originally developed was developed in this big field and there was nothing around it at all for probably 10 years later is that it is that the case will it'll we'll wait until such a point as there's development need in the absolutely it, it, it's to um, the implementation like at the earliest would come with the development applications along this corridor right which are at minimum of 10 years away I would imagine at this point is that would that be accurate or planning Pardon? 10 years there are a number of active applications right in the section around six line at this point in time that we'd be dealing with in the next um, uh, short while, which means that we could time whatever happens with Burnham Thorpe with those applications. Right. So, are there applications um, north of um, Burnham Thorpe on Six Line, or just the ones we're dealing with right now below Burnham Thorpe? Um, you actually have two. Uh, as a confidential report, you have two applications: the Star Oak application and the MGO application, which are right along Six Line and um, Burnham Thorpe but on your agenda tonight. I guess I missed that. Is it north of Burnham Thorpe? Yes, wow. the Star Oak okay. application is to the north. The four agendas got, got me confused. I have to have a close look at that before we get into that. Um, the, uh, when you were, during this process, was there consideration given to the uh, connections and the potential opportunities that exist along the transit corridor, along the 407? Because that's uh, something long-term that Metro Links, I guess, in the province are considering. In terms of a vehicular connection to Highway 407? Public transit. A transit corridor? Because there's the transit corridor that is anticipated at some point in the future along the 407. So was there any consideration given to connectivity to that, um, to bring that public transit, uh, um, I guess, connectivity into that area? Um, essentially, no. What we did look at is uh, the corridor as it has been identified through the North Oakville Secondary Plan, um, and really to establish the right-of-way and the character or, and the facilities within that. Any mm -hmm. connections? Um, to adjacent uh, roadways were not considered as part of the okay. study. Um, the, de the detailed design process, when will that start? 
again, it's a long-term process. We have to establish, um, first get ownership, um, update our official plan policies, and, uh, and uh, try to, and determine the financial component of that prior to uh, the detailed design process. And as we mentioned, it is a long-term process. So that will happen, that'll happen post the acquisition of capital, is that correct? Uh, it'll, it could happen in parallel, but we right. do have to establish all of those uh, policy updates. Um, Timing-wise, in terms of uh, detailed design, uh, it would be uh, one or two years prior to construction, okay. which again, at the earliest, uh, not with development, would be at the 10 to 20 year mark. So if, um, if, if, if one of the uh, residents were to ask you the question tomorrow, how long, like the existing residents that, that have some of these large lots, and I, a number of our constituents are still there, maintain their, their large, um, um, you know, former rural properties and, and, and farms and such. What would you tell them in terms of what their expectations should be in, in terms of when um, they need to be looking at, uh, you know, the, the substantive changes to this community? In terms of timing, we, um, again, are trying to establish a lot of this through the development application process, which, as you know, is... It's a, ongoing. It's, it's ongoing, but it's also, it, it's not immediate. It's, it's, a, it's in phase and over a 20-year period. So to see the corridor in its entirety would take, you know, up to the 20 years at the earliest, I would say. Okay. I mean, this has been a moving target since I came to council. I mean, Absolutely. this is one of the first issues that... Uh, uh, Councillor Elgar and I and the others that were around the table at the time we're dealing with with OPA 198 was that whole issue of exactly. you know how do you how do you do all this and still maintain um, you know the the community until that until that point because there's a lot of folks there that were here 14 years ago that said I want to stay there as long as possible and I guess mm -hmm. they're still counting the days that they can remain in their community so uh, before the development becomes too too uh, substantial for them to maintain their their um, their properties. Um, I guess that's all. I, I really, I, 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 thanks for the answers to Councillor Elgar or to Councillor uh, uh, Adams's questions regarding the timing, because that actually brought me quite a bit of relief for today. Because I was a little apprehensive about the how quickly we'd be seeing this coming forward. Thank you. You're welcome, Councillor Demoff. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation, oh. Lynn, and, and thanks uh, to my colleague Councillor Elgar for all his work. I think a multi-use trail addition is is something that's really beneficial for this. Can you go back to the, the map you had that had the, um, the road in purple, Burnham mm -hmm. Thorpe Road in purple? Study area? That one. Mm -hmm. So the multi-use trail is going to be on the purple sections, correct? Uh, yes, correct. So what happens in the gray section of the William Allen Parkway? Actually, if you bear with me. I'm William Hall. I first sorry. saw this question coming at some point this evening. So what you have before, oh, excuse me. Almost. So what, before, what you have before you is the No Earth Oakville Trails plan. Um, the area that we're looking at um, as part of the study is this blue area, which, as you can see, is to be determined as part of this study, uh, which is going to be the buffered um, bike lanes and now the addition of the multi-use trail on one side. The other area is um, over here, which is the west section, which um, is going to have, again, the two... Um, the two buffered uh, bike lanes. The areas that are going to have multi-use trail in addition to the Burnham Thorpe Air, um, Road corridor is along William Halton Parkway, <coughs> which is um, labeled here New Burnham Thorpe, but we know that's the, not the new name, um, along, so along here and also um, up Neagawa. So those are the other corridors that have a multi-use trail um, in proximity to this Burnham Thorpe Road. So so you've answered the question that the multi-use trail then will go from one end of Oakville straight to the end of Burnham Thorpe then. So it'll be a, f a full connection there. There will be with a, a network, yes. There will be a full network from essentially Brawny Road along um, William Halton Parkway and then the, the users could continue along William Har Halton Parkway um, to either to the north, continuing on that roadway, or continue along um, the new Burnham, or the Burnham Thorpe corridor. Okay, so, but it's, and they're they're providing just a multi-use trail, not an on-road bike lane. Is that right? 
the um, William Halton Parkway? I believe it's both. Or has it got both? Um, it's, it just says regional bicycle facility, so I'm just not. Maltese Trail. But no on-road bike, bike lane? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my only other question had to do where you, the picture where you had off peak, you, there's a section that's going to have off peak mm -hmm. parking. Where's, where is the parking in, in your pretty picture? So not that, that one. So where, where physically is the parking going? So through the, um, through, uh, during the, uh, peak periods, we will have four lanes of traffic in order to accommodate the, tr um, the traffic being generated in the core sections. Um, the off-peak parking is going to be um, on these two lanes. So it transitions from two lanes uh, in the off-peak period to four lanes in the peak period. Okay, so so the bike lane is going to be between the... It will be the passenger side door that would be opening into the bike lane, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Hutchins. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, Councillor Damoff asked a lot of my questions here. I was con confused as why the, in the core section the bike lane seems to be protected with the people parking on the, on the offshore, whilst in, on all the other sections, the bike lane isn't protected. Why wouldn't we do the same thing everywhere and protect the bike lane, put it on the inside so the passenger door? Well, through the other corridors, uh, we have uh, the amount of tra traffic being generated is, is much, um, much different, is a, lot, is a lot lower. So to put in, um, to put in the bike lanes, so let's just put that up here. And to provide for on-street parking within those sections, um, we are feasible, again, looking at uh, vegetation along that corridor and if there's any uh, significant trees or utilities that have to um, be within that corridor is uh, why uh, the location is where it is. But again, in order to be respectful of the 24 meters and trying to minimize uh, a wide um, corridor throughout here is uh, why we have a, s let me uh, propose the, um, the off-peak parking uh, within that same 24 meter corridor along uh, Vernon Thorpe Road. Yes, but a, a bicycle lane which is protected obviously is a lot safer than one that is out within the traffic. So if you're putting it in and this is a new road, why not design it in to be safer for the for the bicyclists? I mean, you can you can you can just jiggle around the space. Through you, Your Worship, uh, Councillor Hutchins, the, the normal location anywhere we have parked vehicles in town is to put the bike lane at, uh, on the driver's side of the uh, vehicle. Uh, and f with the addition of the off-peak parking, though, we have no choice but to put the uh, bike lane to the right of the vehicle or on the passenger side. Um, that these are lay-by parking spaces for the most part, uh, and um, with the buffered uh, width of the uh, the bike lane, uh, there will be sufficient room to open the door. I still think that since we're designing new here, why can't we start designing bike lanes that are safe, so that they are off the road, so that they are protected? I mean, well, you're well, just moving are, These are the safe space. bike lanes, Councillor Hutchins. We wouldn't be recommending anything that wasn't safe. All right, then. Uh, Madam Clerk, I understand we have at least one registered delegation. Would you call the delegations? Uh, yes, we have Karen Brock again from Oakville Green. Here to speak to this item. Ms. Brock, encore. <laughs> Council looks forward to your information. My toys, toys set up here. Um, yes, my name is Karen Brock, and is this on? 
Okay. My name is Karen Brock and I'm uh, representing Oakville Green a Conservation Association once again. Um, Oakville Green uh, was involved in the uh, two stakeholder meetings, or at least I attended two of the stakeholder meetings, so it's always nice to be invited to those. One of them was in August, and we were hoping for pina coladas, but it didn't happen. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, it's interesting. It's exciting to be a part of this, but I think it's also frustrating because I think we all understand how uh, dramatically our our town is going to be changing uh, in 20 years. So uh, although it's good to anticipate, I think there are still some things that uh, when it comes down to the fine tuning, we, we have to be very careful of. Um, I unfortunately couldn't find a whole lot online uh, for the agenda items tonight, but uh, as fortune would have it, I did come across um, this rather fat book done uh, by the front door, which I will return, I promise, <laughs> even though I've, I've scritched in the edges. But um, I did want to point out that there is a section which is uh, Appendix D, I believe, which is the Urban Forestry Report. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sort of on the, going on the fly here just because I didn't have a chance to look at it ahead of time. I am happy to see that there, um, um, there is an inventory of 40 uh, significant trees in very good condition. And I do want to point out that of the 40, 38 are very large um, Carolinian native trees. So um, it's, it's fabulous. So bur oaks, white pines, hackberries, all the ones that we're trying to uh, encourage the town to plant now. Um, and I think they, they've survived this long. I think they'll continue to survive. I'm also happy to see that there uh, does appear to be on page six of the staff report states that the North Oakville East Secondary Plan notes that design standards will respect the existing character of the road and its abutting uses, uh, to which may include unique approaches to matters such as grading and preservation of vegetation along routes. Uh, and I think we've heard this and experienced the frustration when new roads go in uh, or new developments go in, everything is sort of uh, mowed right to the, uh, the walls. And uh, I sure hope that we can see uh, some unique approaches. And, and I feel hopeful by the, just the, the um, title, you know, the Brynhamthorpe Character Study. And, and I think uh, we hear, hear more and more about the importance of the natural heritage, uh, which I think adds value um, to, to our community. Um, also, I did want to point out that, uh, and I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, on page nine of the staff report that says there are opportunities within limited sections of Burnham Thorpe Road, where at the detailed design stage, staff can explore options to preserve existing trees within uh, the right of way. Some existing trees could be incorporated within the design to shade pedestrians, hooray, under a canopy that serves to symbolize and celebrate the history of this roadway. So uh, I think, the, I'd like to see that this is, this is happening differently. And um, certainly I live very close to Sixth Line in Upper Middle and uh, that road was widened 25 years ago and I invite you all to walk by there now and it still uh, looks pretty desolate. So um, I hope that this could change. Um, What am I doing? Um, I'm also happy to see uh, in this urban forestry report um, that the uh, trees, the native trees found to be in good condition, which as you know are, are very many, um, would be preserved and incorporated in, into the road design. So um, that said, um, you know, it was good to be a part of the study, but I felt a lot of frustration because we were looking at a lot of mock-ups and a lot of designs, but what I wanted to see was what does it look like now? And obviously, along that whole road, it's very rural, uh, and there's no doubt about it that um, we're expected that that's going to change. But I did want to specifically um, address the western portion, that, that, little, uh, that little strip at the end, Lynn. I don't know whether you can pull that up. Um. Oops. <laughs> That's <not it. laughs> I didn't press anything, I swear.
Does that help, Karen? Uh, it's not quite the diagram that I'm looking for. I'll continue anyway, um, just as you're, you're speaking to that. Um, I did want to point out that that western uh, section is particularly um, well treed right now. Also, um, Brynenthorpe is going to dead end, which I think is pretty obvious. Uh, that road is going to dead end at 16 Mile Valley. Um, even though there is some residential uh, development expected there, um, I'm looking at this area as probably the, the, the most hopeful area where we can preserve a lot of the uh, very large trees, especially along the, uh, the roadway. But I think it's also important to note that Glen Orkey sort of wrap around, wraps around the uh, top of that residential area in that western portion and continues in quite a wide band along the western edge. Uh, and there's also a very significant uh, natural heritage link um, just before, um, uh, just west of Niagawa Boulevard. So, so it's a pretty um, important wide connection just to connect uh, wildlife uh, north and south. Um, but I'm hoping that, as I say, uh, I, I actually mentioned that I was frustrated with the lack of um, pictures uh, of the um, western section. So I've got some here, if I can put it on this. Is that as, that's as close as we can get, is it? Great. Um, this is um, on Burnham Thorpe Road looking west, uh, just west of Neagawa. So I'm not sure whether it's included. Um, there are a large row of trees here you see uh, um, on my right. Um, I'm not sure that it's actually included in the urban forest inventory. Um, but you can see how large, uh, actually maybe if the room was darkened a bit, you could see how uh, wide those, those trees are at the base. Um, the good news is it appears that the right-of-way is going to be uh, minimal here in that it's 22 meters, but uh, I think I have to be careful what I wish for because I am concerned that if we do make this right-of-way 22 meters that it's going to affect these large oak trees. So um, when it gets down to that detailed design stage, um, and I hear a lot of the cyclists and pedestrians, especially cyclists, who gets frustrated with the uh, lack of continuity. So um, I'm just concerned, though, that by having continuity uh, for sidewalks, that we're going to have to get a little more creative. So when uh, push comes to shove, when we come down to the detailed design, is there an opportunity like there is in Ward 4 where you can have the sidewalk on one side and a, a multi-use trail or a bike lane on the other uh, in order to preserve uh, those two trees? So in which case does that mean that you do need a 24-meter right-of-way in order to to allow um, the, um, the cycleway or the sidewalk, whichever is most appropriate, on the north side of, of those large oaks. So um, that would be my only word of caution uh, in looking at that. Um, and I'm happy to see that it looks as if uh, the report does recommend that, um, I guess I'm down to one minute, uh, that the sidewalk can curve around some of the base of the trees. And I'm suggesting that that might even be possible with the uh, um, with the roadway in some cases too, where as you can see, uh, there's a large uh, portion of forest. This is actually looking eastward, uh, some white pines, and yet across the road there isn't much. So if there is an opportunity to create an interesting uh, small bend uh, in the road, uh, that might be uh, optimal too. So anyway, um, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate you. Uh, listening to my concerns about the urban forest canopy, which um, I think will uh, be a great benefit and, and add to the value of the homes that will eventually end up in that area. Thank you very much for your many constructive comments. Questions? Councillor Knoll. Not so much a question, but a, uh, a question of the delegate, but a question of staff. Um, the area that uh, Mrs. Brock was um, uh, showing us, I think that is probably uh, the portion of the road that will become the William Hart Halton Parkway, is it not? 
Um, as you see in the, screen, uh, the slide before you, um, yeah. there is a, a considerable portion of William Halton Parkway that is just uh, west of Neagawa. Right. Um, and then the actual Burnhamthorpe corridor that's um, as part of this study is uh, actually it's west. It starts about. 500 meters west of fourth line. Yeah, because I think the area that uh, I think the area that Mrs. Brock was showing us was that fourth line. That's what it looked like. So, I think it'd be important that those comments also be communicated with the regional staff as well, yes, because indeed. they'd be administering and managing the um, the, the, pro the project for the uh, the Halton Parkway. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so, I look for a motion to receive. Sorry. Oh, we have another delegation. Perhaps. Madam Clerk. No, not listed, but they might be. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. They may be out in the audience. Are there other members of the public with information for council on this matter? Well, come on down. Please introduce yourself and share your information. My name is Leon Hawes. I came totally unprepared only wishing to just gather the information that's going on. I sat on the stakeholders committee for this at Lynn's invitation and have followed it through since, as far as I'm aware, inception in, uh, in the spring of 2013. Um, I've raised recently with the region, because I understand it's their jurisdiction, the concern of splitting the existing Burnham Thorpe Road into two pieces, one whole two halves held by the town with a regional sec in, uh, section in between the two. And to this end, I have not yet received from the region um, any response to my concerns, which is why is why are the two intersections on Burnham Thought Road? Now, I realize this is a technical question and it should have been addressed much earlier, but I had no uh, understanding until relatively recently that in fact, this whole design this whole uh, transportation corridor has been handled by two different people and my feeling is is that presently it's a regional road it's going to be a new regional road that intersects with it surely this design should in fact be coordinated by the present owner which is the presumably the uh, the region and at that point all these interfaces problems can be resolved. Um, so that's a concern that I have. The other part of it is, is that I'm very pleased to see that uh, the cyclists needs for separation from traffic is being well looked after. I, uh, I allude to um, Councillor Hutchins concerned about having two different types of designs and although uh, Mr. Cozy and I are uh, constantly in, uh, in discussion with regard to cyclists and separation of cyclists from traffic, I do not necessarily agree with uh, the idea that you can have on one section of the road uh, a cyclist on the traffic side of a parked car and on the other, uh, other part of the road have the cyclist lane on the passenger side of a parked car. I sense that uh, Councillor Hutchins has a, got a good point and is to make it consistent throughout and uh, is there any reason why it cannot be looked at? But that I realise is, a, is, a, is something for detailed design. But, so my major point right now is it's a regional road now. It's going to be interfaced with a new regional road. Surely the region are responsible for pulling this thing together to make sure that it works and then if necessary hand off then at that point hand off back to the town thank you thank you very much for your information My sir is another yes welcome hi my name is uh, Danny Costa if it's possible to get uh, clarification with applications for development are we saying that infrastructure like no infrastructure and no development are expected until 10 to 20 years or is there the possibility that there could be some development and some infrastructure before the 10 to 20 years um through you uh, your worship I, as noted earlier there are some development applications pr uh, presently before um, uh, staff and are currently being circulated um, in terms of timing there with those applications um, uh, before uh, staff, uh, there is a possibility to see that development in the short term in terms of the area along 6th line. Um, and with that, could be some infrastructure in 
included along this corridor um, in order to service that development. Um, but again, in terms of the construction and implementation of Burnham Thorpe Road, um, it is a longer term process. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> it sounded to me a little bit like maybe, maybe not. Councillor Demoff, do I see your hand? I, I don't have a question for the gentleman who just spoke, but I do have a question for staff. You have the floor. Okay. Um, just going back to what Leon was, was asking about, I just want to clarify something because he said, said something about it being dealt with during detailed design. It, is there going to be any opportunity to move those bike lines later, or the ship will sail once we've approved this tonight, will it not? With respect to the, lo the location uh, and number of lanes, or no, not the, not the number, um, but in terms of whether or not it's on the door side or the passenger side of a car that's parked. So I, I get the impression that once this is voted on tonight, that those bike lanes, the EA has been done under the, we're going to approve them being on bump out parking and the bike lanes being on the inside. You know what I'm asking. Yes, I do. Um, I mean, detailed design, there's always an opportunity to look at things. But I just caution you that when you have off-peak parking, um, it's difficult. Uh, you, you could, you'd have to mark the lanes uh, in a way that wouldn't be confusing the drivers and motorists because that lane will be uh, occupied by a vehicle as a fourth travel lane during parts of the day and other parts of the day it'll be a parking lane. So how do you mark that? How do you not cause that confusion? We went through this whole exercise um, when we looked at the Midtown EA and how we would have off potential off-peak parking uh, on certain roads in the Midtown and how we would actually implement uh, cycle lanes that were either on the passenger side or on, on the driver's side. And in our thorough review of the situation with uh, Mr. Clapham, our sustainable transportation coordinator, the, the advice was not, not to put the uh, cycle lane on the uh, um, like the, the 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 hybrid cycle lane that sort of disappears and, and and comes back depending on the parking so I would suggest to you that it you are approving the cycle lanes to be how we're proposing them but uh, at detailed design if we are not going to if for some reason we're not going to have off-peak parking um, uh, you know we could look at uh, modifying the design at that time it wasn't so much the off-peak parking section because I like that part it's the other part. So is, is there an opportunity where you've got the bump out parking to be able to move those bike lanes? If, is there cha a chance to discuss that at a later opportunity? So the off-peak parking plan is good. There, there definitely would be, but if we're talking bump out parking, if we're talking lay-by parking or conventional parking, that, that'll be key as to where the bike lane resides. Because it would be nice to just have a straight line with the bike lane in one and and... I mean, the discussion of which one I understand is better. What you, I understand what yeah. you're saying. It, it all depends on whether it's lay-by parking or not. That's going to change the nature of the boulevard and, and, you know, what we were trying to accomplish with parking there. Okay. But we could still have a discussion we as sure we can. go. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Noll. Sorry, I don't want to exacerbate that point. I just want to be perfectly clear, though, because I, I want to make sure my understanding is correct to what we're approving here. Um, I think I got, I think the answer was reasonably clear, but I just want to be certain. We're not approving the fine grain detail of this plan. That is detailed design work, right? So this discussion about passenger side, driver side, et cetera, all that stuff is yet to be worked out, correct? Well, c mostly correct, Councillor. Um, we, you know, the EA does propose uh, certain types of bike lanes, one side or the other, but you're correct in your first part where you said, you're, you're approving an EA which says there's so many lanes, the corridor width is this much, there's a sidewalk, there's a multi-use pad. This right. is what the features will include. Right. Detailed design will hash out all okay, the rest that's of it. What I, that's what I understood. So there's plenty of time to, to work this and even change um, smaller details of this plan so we don't have to make finite decisions tonight. Correct. Maybe as much as 10 to 20 years. Yeah, that's right. Um, second point is um, on this uh, issue of the, the, the phasing of development, the timing of development of there. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no allocation currently for development in that area, is there? There's, we don't have any excess. That, that plan is still in process, correct? 
through you, your worship to the uh, councillor, um, the two applications, the MGO and the Star Oak that you're dealing with in another report do have allocation under oh, the current geez, program. Okay. Yeah, but that's, they're talking six line though. So six line has allocation? Oh, wow. Okay. I certainly missed that. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Who wants to move receipt of the presentation? Councillor Elgar, uh, oh, Councillor Adams, you want to do something else? Uh, that would, uh, I, I just want to include uh, recommendation three also, okay, so that everybody's uh, clear on you, that. You said receipt. We're not moving receipt. We're uh, moving, moving approval. An approval. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. So the, um, this, I think what's being moved is the staff recommendation with a third point relating to the multi-use path. Is that correct? correct? And also the amendment to the um, notice of uh, completion yes. to begin on February 19th. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Um, is this still moved by you? I, I, well, I thought it was. Sorry. <laughs> is there somebody different? But uh, you know, because you have it written favor? up, so you could put yes. it. Okay. <laughs> opposed. It, opposed it fairly. <laughs> Good news. It carried. That was the first. <laughs> Good news. It carried. Council, can I ask your attention for items, confidential discussion item C3? Are you prepared to deal with this with a motion in public, or do you need to go into camera? Yeah. Councillor Knoll? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that carries. All right, now we come to the advisory committee minutes, and that's in the addendum. And we have a number of recommendations pertaining to items 6A, B, and C, and the remainder of the minutes to be received. Councillor Duddick moves. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that is carried. Uh, a motion to rise and report to council. Councillor Grant, thank you. All in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Um, I rise and report that the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent items 1 and 2, confidential consent items C1 and C2, public hearing item 3, discussion items 4, 5, and 6, confidential discussion item C3, and advisory committee minutes item 7, as noted by the clerk. A mover and seconder for the report is in order. Councillor Duddick and Councillor Lapworth, all in favor? Opposed, if any, and the report is adopted. Council, is there new business of an emergency, congratulatory, or condolence nature? Uh, Councillor Duddick. Your Worship, I'd just like to take this opportunity to congratulate my ward mate on the recent uh, recipient of the Paul Harris Award. And I understand there were several others, but I would ask members of Council to join with me in congratulating her. Here, here. Congratulations, Councillor DeWolf. Um, that being said, a mover and seconder for the bylaws would be in order. Councillor Knoll and Councillor Elgar. This is authority for the bylaws as listed in the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and the bylaws are adopted. That completes our agenda. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been great working with you. We are adjourned.